Thank you. Uh, we've already called the meeting to order and called the roll. We had an executive session starting at 6 o'clock. Um, the first thing, first order of business is to swear in of new commission members. I see um, that Dave Turner is here. So Dave, if you would come up front and uh, we'll do a swearing in for you. Here, oath of here. office. Just stand there. And Dave, the, the oath is actually at the podium if you like to be We're looking at it at the same time. Some okay, sure. <laughs> Um, I solemnly affirm, I solemnly repeat affirm. after me, <laughs> that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And of the state of Ohio. And of the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the charter. Observe the provisions of the charter. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of Justice, Justice System Task Force Alternate. And will faithfully discharge the duties and responsibilities of Justice System Task Force Alternate. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome. <laughs> <I say. laughs> nice work. And is, is Lindsay here? Lindsay Burke? Yes. Did you get something last week? Oh, did you not see it? He's wondering about someone getting in touch with him. What happens next? Do I get an email or something? I haven't Yes, you do. You should have gotten a letter. It said in September sometime. Oh, you'll hear something. Okay. In September. Fine. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, next item on the agenda is announcements. Um, Brian, I, I'm sure you have some. Of course. Um, so first of all, uh, Patty, do you want to talk a little bit about where Touch a Truck is at? It's happening Saturday, August 27th, uh, 2 to 5 p.m. at Mills Lawn School. And Patty, why don't you tell us about what the event's all about? We, we actually had a meeting about it today, a staff meeting. We have uh, several pieces of large equipment coming. We have a helicopter coming from CareFlight. We have two MICU units, one... Uh, one from Kettering Health and another from um, from um, Mercy Health. We have all kinds of village equipment coming. Um, I know Johnny's bringing three electric trucks. Jason is bringing uh, quite a number of pieces of equipment. We're hoping for the bat wing mower. Uh, we've got a pink concrete truck coming, fire engines, police cruisers, um, tow trucks. Um, not sure exactly what else, the, because the list is fairly long. Bookmobile. <laughs> Um, the love bug from the Easter seals and um, we will have uh, as well uh, Western Southern Life uh, doing the identikid kits which, where they take the child's picture and do the fingerprint and give it to you to keep um, in case something happens um, we will have uh, free hot dogs chips and drinks for everyone um, so it'll just be a, a good time for the kids to climb around on the equipment and have a lot of fun all right, thanks, Patty. Um, I also just wanted to mention, uh, probably everyone knows, uh, school starts again on Friday. So uh, remember to be careful when you're driving around the schools in the morning and afternoon. Um, the Arts and Culture Commission has been moved. It's usually the second Wednesday of every month, but it's going to happen this Wednesday, the 17th, starting at 7 p.m. That's a public meeting. Um, and Judy, it wasn't in the packet, but I thought it would be nice for you to share about um, the letter we were received from Cleveland. Oh, yeah. We did not receive a letter, which is why oh. it was not in the packet. I, I got a voicemail, actually, just left um, from a representative from the mayor's office from the city of Cleveland, thanking council and especially thanking uh, Lori Asplund for writing a letter encouraging them to um, to uh, move forward with transgender, the transgender bathroom issue. Uh, which they did and which they signed into law on July 20-something. Um, and, and she was just extremely appreciative of it and said the letter was instrumental in helping people to understand what, what the issue was really about. So, yeah, and if it had been a letter, I had to put it, it was just a quick Okay. Letter. And I just thought about that as an announcement because we talk a lot about um, the fact that Yellow Springs can be a role model for the region and for the state. So uh, I just thought that was exciting. And lastly, I wanted to mention that block parties are happening. And um, I don't know if Chrissy will say something about it, but Patty, maybe you could just let people know about the process in case they're still scheduling one. Um, absolutely. Um, what happens is you come into uh, my office and get a special event form, fill that out. 
and we run it through the regular channels. Chrissy has kindly provided us with some information to put in little packets for folks. There's a, a letter from Chrissy explaining the block parties. There's a Know Your Neighbor sheet, and there's a $25 voucher for Tom's. Um, and then once your event is approved, um, we let Chrissy know, and uh, she, she, I believe, advertises where they're going to be. Um, so folks can attend, and uh, it's a good time. I mean, it, it seems to be working out. We've had, what, three this year um, already scheduled, and they're starting to come in pretty quickly. Great. And they start this weekend, and it'll be in the paper this week. Nope, thanks. Right. Anything else? I have one. Um, I give you a little bit of advance notice. Um, the Miami Township Fire and Rescue is doing their 9-11 stair climb on the 10th of September this year. Um, it starts at about 8.30 in the morning. So teams, they're looking for teams um, to, it, it's a fundraising effort. All of the money goes to the 9-11 Memorial Fund um, to help uh, the families of uh, the 9-11 Commission. I know that Officer Penrod has, uh, Sergeant Penrod has Watson. done it a few times. Oh, excuse me, Watson. Um, <laughs> has done it a few times, as has Judy with a child on board and <laughs> back in a in a pack on our back and it's a it's a lot of fun and the exciting thing is is that it's going to be at main building so um, probably one of the few things that main building is open for so you get to get into main building hmm. and run up and down the steps probably a hundred times or more it's a challenge yes mm -hmm. um, you know I think I do want to make an announcement because I'm, I'm looking back at my emails and I don't know, somehow I didn't get it anyway, that the uh, first meeting of the Justice System Task Force is going to be September 13th and there will be a, a mailing going out fairly immediately um, regarding uh, September 13th. At, September 13th. At what time, Judith? At 7.30, sorry. Okay. Is, isn't that what we decided? I'm pretty sure that is what we decided. Yeah. Okay. It's decided now. Um, right. It's decided now. I've got it on my calendar. Yes, at 7.30. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. It includes the minutes of the July 18th regular meeting and the financials for July that were prepared by our finance director. Can I get a motion? And assistant village Don't manager. Move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, review of the agenda. Um, is there anything on the agenda that we would like to move? We've got lots of uh, lots of legislation. Anything we would like to move or add? Um, I would like to move the uh, request from the uh, AACW to new business. I guess it would be new business. Okay. Okay, anything else? Okay, uh, Brian, there is a long list of petitions yes. and communications for you to review. Okay, but I think I can couple several of these. Uh, so we had the mayor's monthly report, business as usual. Um, we got a nice letter from Lisa Walters and Nate Cornett thanking uh, the village, Johnny Burns team for being so helpful for Springs Fest. Uh, Kate Anderson wrote a letter uh, um, suggesting that we should not do any development on the CBE uh, property. So that's the, uh, the land known as the Center for Biz Business and Education. Um, Mary Ann McQueen, and, and she talked about this at our last meeting, has proposed that we look into a utility roundup program. Um, and uh, do you? I think we'll, we we'll can address we'll do, that okay, during that comes, the yeah, utility yeah. discussion. Okay. We got several emails about utility bills and the fact that they uh, look um, a lot, uh, well, they were a lot higher than normal, and that's obviously on our uh, agenda for tonight, so we'll talk in a lot more detail about that. Um, Don Johnson also uh, wrote a letter more specifically to the fact that we needed to be aware of people that uh, needed their utilities for um, life support and making sure that uh, not only were we careful about delaying any um, uh, interruption of utilities, but also that we could get the word out to make sure everyone's aware of being on that list on our website. Uh, I would also propose our Facebook page. Um, 
talked about Karen Patterson's uh, proposal is already on the docket. Um, uh, we got the June and um, uh, May minutes from MVRPC um, and also the June minutes from the Greene County Regional Planning Commission. Uh, I, I did want to note there that um, the Greene County Regional Planning Commission did meetings about what were they, Karen? Walkable community workshops. And one of those happened in Yellow Spring. So I think there's something interesting about that. Um, we also got the YS Chamber News, which highlighted the importance of placemaking and uh, sounded a lot like things that Yellow Springs is doing. And uh, finally, well, I think the other things we talked about. So, uh, but lastly, there was a letter that's on the table from the uh, the Economic Sustainability Commission uh, supporting uh, further activity with the well, land known as Center for Business and Education. Thank you, Brian. Um, we'll move on to... Um, oh, I'm sorry, oh, should Judith should, I guess, should I mention Judith's letter? Is that a communication? It's, it's in with the, I had a letter, right. which is in with the legislation. Well, I think, I think we should note it as a communication. Yes. Um, so Judith Hempfling uh, submitted a letter highlighting that we should uh, potentially table a decision about um, the CBE and uh, ultimately that we should be careful about thinking about how it plays into our economic sustainability plan. Um, okay. I, I have, uh, there was a, something in the packet from Renergy Oh, yeah. Which I didn't understand, yeah. Right. right. Uh, what is that, Judy? I know what it is. Oh. Um, it's a organization west of town that takes mm -hmm. uh, uh, landfill stuff and you, makes methane out of it and makes, uh, oh. does mm -hmm. electricity. Mm -hmm. But, and we send some of our sludge there, I think, but this doesn't, this is useful. <coughs> um, the well, did you see the chart that showed the impact? Right. Yeah, but oh, I mean, okay. I, I don't. Do we send all of our sludge? We, we I mean, we currently send part of our sludge there, but the plan is to eventually send all of our sludge there. And and the Q2 environmental impact is for the village of Yellow Springs. So this yeah. is the impact that we made by the sludge that we sent there to be turned into. Um, nothing, yeah. That, that was, yeah, and, that was not clear. And actually, since we're clarifying things, was it intentional that the uh, the reference to the Strawberry Festival was in the packet? Uh, Patty sent it to me and I put it in the packet. So I, I sent you the It was not intentional, I can tell you that for darn sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> not. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. We don't like to talk about that festival. <laughs> I assume you're talking about in Troy. What's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> there was just there was a page about it in the packet, and I didn't. That's odd. Wasn't sure what it was. Um, okay. Public hearings and legislation. Uh, first reading of ordinance 2016-16. I think we can do this by title only, Judy. All right. This is approving a temporary construction easement for the purpose of creating an access road to construct the water plant and declaring an emergency. Okay. Um, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Patty, would you take um, this one? Sure. Uh, there is a, well, there are more than one 90 degree turns in the um, Jacoby Road where it leads out to the water treatment plant. Um, however, this one will be impossible to get some of the larger trucks and pieces of equipment around um, and get them out to the plant for, for construction. So we have asked um, Ronald and Linda Gillum to provide us with a temporary construction easement um, that will allow us to put in a, a gravel road just for the short term while we're doing the construction. Um, they have granted that and um, once the construction is done, we will restore that um, to its natural state for them. Okay, um, any questions? Uh, this is the first reading. We'll have a second reading at the next meeting. Any questions from council? No. Uh, yeah, no. Patty. Excuse me. It's an emergency. I'm sorry. We've declared an emergency. Yes. So this is the first reading in public hearing. Yes. Uh, that temporary road, is that to be used only for construction and... Yes. The, the other road will still be there. Right. Um, it, it won't hurt if someone drives over it. It'll just be... It's just going to be gravel. Okay. Um, but it... 
it will be there because the angle is too sharp to get the trucks, the larger trucks around it, so it'll be, it'll widen it. No, so I was just we wondering where we, where, was it going to be signed so it says for construction vehicles only? No, no, okay. no I don't believe okay. that's a plan. Johnny, do you? No, we're essentially just widening the corner right. for the okay. big trailers. Oh. Okay, I was just wondering if it was a separate road. Um, this is the second, re well, first reading uh, and an emergency ordinance, so I will open the public hearing for comments. Questions? Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Humphrey. Yes. McQueen? Yeah. Sims? Yes. How? Yes. Winter? Yes. Uh, next is uh, resolution 2016-39, and let's read that in by in full. All right, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into a termination of development agreement. That's, excuse me a minute, that's a long one. Um, <laughs> I can be really fast or, well, you've got to, I mean, I'm sure that- we'll Just, just in. read it in by time alone. Okay. okay. Yep, authorizing the village manager to enter into a termination of development agreement with the Yellow Springs and Miami Township Community Improvement Corporation and the Education Village Incorporated. Okay, uh, this is, uh, has been Melissa's project. I, she has been working on this. Um, just as... Can make a motion. Oh, can I do a motion from somebody else? Sorry. So, Second. Okay. Um, so this relates to um, the, uh, the property known as the Center for Business and Education out at the corner of Easton and Dayton Young Springs. Well, I'll actually take this one and okay. Melissa will take the next one. Okay. Um, Village staff was approached uh, some time ago by um, members of community resources about the possibility of um, terminating the agreement between the, the two entities and returning the property back to the village. Um, to that end, uh, we've been talking to them and it was brought to council. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the first time was, but um, the last time was. This resolution is a result of that. Um, what it does is it terminates the agreement um, between the two entities, essentially giving the property back to the village in full. And I know that Dino is here um, in case anyone has any questions. Um, I have to say, my understanding is that the village never owned the property and that this is being given in lieu of the. Money. That's so correct. That's really probably returning it. Right. That's probably better wording. Yes, that's correct. Right. The money of the th that was the three hundred thousand yeah, dollars. Right. I guess right. that's yeah. Right. So um, three hundred thousand dollars from the Village Economic Development Revolving Loan Fund was loaned to um, Education Village for the purchase to go into the purchase price of the property, which was I think a total of four hundred and ten thousand. I think was the purchase price of the property. Um, there was uh, an additional loan for, or grant from the Community Foundation. Um, so um, I think as, as things have moved on with the community resources with the, um, I think that they're, they're just not interested any longer and would like the village to take, um, to take over the property um, as opposed to maintaining ownership. So um, Dino, did you have anything that you would like to add? No, currently that was pretty much, we've run it as far as the course of that we, could, we want to take it. I don't think there's anything more <clears throat> with the time and the work that's going to be involved with it that we can't really go any further. I think you guys are, are better situated. I think staff is better situated to handle it and go in that direction of making the improvements. I think, and, and clearly I think it's been established, community resources is a, is a, a nonprofit group made up of a lot of incredible volunteers over the years, and there has never been any <coughs> financial commitment or, or financial wherewithal within the community resources organization to develop the property. It had always been seen as a, as a joint venture sort of project between the village and community resources. So um, there was never, the idea that at this point that community resources could, could pay back the loan is um, they so we're seeing we're seeing the property coming back as as more than an equal uh, repayment of that loan. Um, it gives the it gives the village the ability to control where it happens to that property as opposed to selling it. And 
us having absolutely no control over what happens. Um, personally, I think it, um, it's something that is a benefit to the village um, to have this piece of property. It's a valuable piece of property, and um, it has been part of, of you know, something that we've looked at, at developing. The village has looked at developing um, since the 1996, so, um, and even earlier than that. So um, I, I think this is, a, this is a, a generous thing for community resources to be offering to the village personally. Any other comments or questions? Comments or questions from citizens? Dawn. Um, Dawn Johnson, can um, you please come up. Sure. Um, a couple of questions, actually. Um, so, uh, <laughs> the village ownership of the property, will Education Village Inc. or community resources be involved in any of the disposition of the property in the future? Um, there is no indication that they that there is any interest in that. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, uh, through our meetings, uh, community resources has I think articulated what Dino just represented, which is that the village is in a good position to look at that development and what should happen. What happens to the covenant that's on the property? Um, at this point, and I I don't know since since the village is going to own it, I don't know that it's quite as important. I, I think that I would see I would see us going through a process. I mean I you know we have not decided anything to do with that property, but I would think that, that we're now in a position to establish an RFP or, or some sort of a development map plan, just as we're talking about doing for the glass farm, as how we would move forward with that. So you know I think the idea of the covenants I think the general tenor of the covenants that it not become a strip center, that it not become uh, a competing retail district to downtown, I think that, that I would just assume the council would honor that. I think that that, not, no heavy industrial, I mean, it's not, we don't have heavy industrial zoning, so it couldn't become heavy industrial. So um, I, I see the covenants as probably not being important, but just the, philo the, the, the philosophy behind them, I think is It's important. a legal document. Um, third question is the the um, resolution references some unused funds. Were there any unused funds from the loan? Do you, you want to speak to that, or did you want me to? I think you can. We, we talk, that was for car, car engineers, right? No, we, she's talking about the community <coughs> resources and what you still have in the in the bank account. And part of that was used to pay for the um, the, uh, the, appraisal, the appraisal and all that. But the rest of the funds, as, as is noted in the um, in the resolution, will come back to the village. Okay. Is there? Do you know the amount? Yes. Can we know that amount? I think it's like twenty nine thousand in the neighborhood. Right. Yeah. The the, 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 less, the appraisal. Less the appraisal. Five, I think, or something. Like that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, Dan. Oh, thank you. I'm Dan Reyes, and uh, a couple of questions, well, maybe one comment first, which I, I think, Karen, your introduction about this being an interesting opportunity for the village is a good way to look at it, uh, as far as having some control over uh, this property and the gateway, potentially. Um, I, I was curious, though, two questions about this. I don't know, the first one maybe uh, sheds light on, on my hesitating, having evolved a bit about when and where to ask this. Uh, two pieces of legislation are on the table tonight, and I'm wondering to what extent they're inter uh, interconnected. The one is the uh, currently being discussed the dissolution of the prior agreement and the transfer of the property. The other is uh, the Army Corps of Engineers grant. And the relationship between those two, for me, um, would not be a necessary one, but I don't know how the council uh, is, is picturing that. Uh, the reason I, I ask that in a way, and with some caution for the second piece of legislation, uh, is that I think if the village is going to look at this property as an opportunity, uh, it ought to consider it fairly broadly, and not necessarily be prepared to rehash what was talked about you know, three or 10 years ago, but to, to look at it afresh. Because there's um, some reason why it's been stolen for more than a decade. Um, so you know, not rushing to sort of agree back into the prior uh, arrangement with the Army Corps uh, would be a kind of provisional recommendation. I didn't know where you guys were sitting on that. 
The other one is a question about the property, and this is a, maybe a naive question, but it's again one, uh, if I were looking at this uh, with a sort of broad uh, open canvas, what can you do with this property that's uh, an asset to the village, you know, that, that makes this community stronger, that uh, builds on this community's strengths. And I, I'm wondering is, you know, to what extent the council is satisfied with uh, the assessment of the physical real property uh, as it's been done so far? You know, are there, um, some of the normal title search stuff I'm sure will go on, but has there been an environmental assessment of this property, for instance? Uh, and to what extent is that satisfactory uh, for covering the range of possible uses? For, um, that's enough for basically two questions, but they're complex. There was extensive environmental done uh, for the Army Corps grant. So we have, that, a, uh, we have a finding of, of no significant impact. Yeah, impact. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, yeah, the, the, that work had all been done probably 10 years ago. The Army Corps uh, actually has one of the most stringent environmental assessments of anyone. I was going to say, in terms of the covenant, the past covenant, um, it strikes me, it's coming back, and I agree with uh, Dan, that um, the village, this, this piece of legislation says we're terminating this agreement and community resources given the village the land in lieu of the loan uh, that we had given them. Um, what happens next, as far as I'm concerned, is you know a, a decision has not been made yet. Um, the next piece of legislation, so, you know, it's a discussion that we have to have with the community. Uh, and, uh, you know, we haven't even made a decision about yet about the Army Corps of Engineer, uh, you know, that grant. So, step by step, uh, it seems to me. But I agree with you that it's, it's valuable land. It's uh, the gateway, one of our gateways. And, but it's not something that's already been determined as to what will happen. Yeah, the right idea is yet to be determined. Say it again. But, you know, the ultimate right idea seems yet to be determined. Which, um, it'll take some work to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so I just want to uh, kind of again thank Community Resources for maintaining both the integrity and the vision of what this community asset has always been about, and I, and I think that's uh, been expressed uh, in a couple venues, but that is to improve affordability for the village um, and ultimately do something complimentary. So uh, I think this really reflects that, and I appreciate that the village is being trusted to uh, you know properly steward the, the land known as the CBE. So thank you. Thanks for adding those work good words and yes and, and definite appreciation for past and present members of community resources who have put a lot of uh, blood sweat and tears into this project um, for a lot of years and um, we really appreciate it um, are we ready to take a vote all the we don't have a public hearing um, all those in favor signify saying aye aye um, Okay, the next piece of legislation is, um, even like here than the first. Is it then just read by title only and we'll have Melissa take care of it? Yes, indeed. Yes, the title will yeah. take us home. This is authorizing participation of the Village of Yellow Springs, Green County, Ohio with the United States Army Corps of Engineers, USACD. The revised design and construction of water and wastewater infrastructure improvements to serve the Center for Business and Education, authorizing the village manager to act for and on behalf of the village of Yellow Springs in executing, accepting, or otherwise approving all documents, agreements, instruments, or other necessary papers required by the USACE to implement said participation in the project. Thank you. Can I do a motion, please? So moved. Second. Right. Okay. Um, this has been Melissa's project, and uh, I'll turn it over to her. So in tonight's packet is, uh, you'll find all of the materials that were previously submitted as it relates to the background on this uh, grant. Um, there are eight pages, um, and I'll just quickly go through what was in each of them. 
Um, um, I don't know if we need to necessarily. Um, the the first the first uh, document is basically a uh, synopsis of significant events. So this uh, grant has been in process for approximately ten years. Um, so there, it goes through everything that has happened with the land um, as community resources were involved, um, all, of the, all of the different events that happened um, as it related to that property and to the grant. And then there are also a few items on here um, in moving forward should council decide to um, accept this resolution and move forward with a reduced scope grant. Um, there are also some um, cost estimates from Mike Heinz um, and Heinz Engineering for the construction cost. Um, what this grant will basically be doing, um, the original grant was to run um, storm water and uh, water and sewer uh, all throughout the actual property. Um, and there were also going to be um, some roads involved, but that was a separate grant. So as it related to the Army Corps of Engineers, it was to originally run all of the water, storm water, and sewer throughout the entire property. So this reduced scope is basically going to extend those three utilities from um, East Enon Road up to the entrance of the property. And um, so there are some construction estimates from Mike Heinz. Um, the project would cost approximately $260,000 for construction. And then um, on page six, there is uh, some financial in information as it related to the original agreement. Um, the total project was estimated at 596,000 with uh, 417,000 being reimbursed to the village. Um, and the new reduced scope, um, the total cost of this would be 458,000 and then 272,000 would be um, reimbursed to the village. So, Kind of how this started was, like I said, the, the, grant, the grant has been in process for 10 years. The village has already spent approximately $130,000, um, as it was noted earlier, on the engineering. This was all strictly engineering um, as it related to the, to the cost with the grant that the village had already spent. We'd only received um, reimbursement of about $1,300. So with the uh, changes in, um, in staff, um, at both the Army Corps of Engineers as well as within the village. Um, this wasn't really kept up on and followed through with. So the village spent money and we basically did not get reimbursed for it. Um, so shortly after I started with the village, um, I started working immediately with uh, Denise Swinger who was greatly involved with trying to organize this under uh, Laura Curlis's direction. So we kind of, um, recreated all of the financials. Um, it was actually three different grants and some of the money was kind of, um, it wasn't documented very well. Um, so we had to try to figure out what was related um, to the Army Corps grant, what was related to an ODOT grant, um, and I think there was an OPWC grant as well. So all three of those grants were still on the books. None of them were closed out, even though two of the grants were totally finished. The OPWC and the ODOT grant were completely finished. So we kind of recreated the financials to try to figure out um, what was owed to the village, because that was, that was what was most important to us, was to get the reimbursement back for the money that the village had already spent. So that's kind of how this thing even started, was to figure out how the village could get um, reimbursed. And then, um, you know, as, as time kind of went on, um, the, the thought to reduce the scope so that um, since the Army Corps of Engineers still did have that grant open and available to us, um, it was decided that we would try to reduce the scope and see if, you know, they would even be um, open to that, uh, that reduction in scope, which they were. So then we kind of started working towards that. Um, so it, it's been a very long process um, in that we had to clean up the financials to figure out what would be owed to us. And then um, we started to try to figure out um, if we could reduce the scope, what that would look like and how much that would cost and if the Army Corps of Engineers would even be open to that. So here we are today. Um, we've got the cost to move forward um, should council decide to do that. And um, we know what's been spent and what would need to be spent and what would be reimbursed um, back to the village um, if we move forward. So there's also attached to this resolution, there is a, um, revised agreement outlining the reduction in scope that the Army Corps of Engineers um, attorneys have, uh, our council have looked at. 
um, our council looked at, and so um, I'm open for any questions. That's pretty much the gist of it. Any comments or questions? And I think that it was interesting that that um, what I think was discovered at some point is that they're part of the cost of the project. There were never utilities extended down Dayton Yellow Springs Road to the entry of, of mm -hmm. the uh, of the project, and you know, so here we would have had a project that had all the infrastructure in the middle, but nothing, nothing to take it there. And thanks to Dawn, um, she actually drew a map. She actually, this was her suggestion, actually, that uh, um, why don't we take that money and just extend the uh, extend the utilities from East Enon. Uh, down to the center of the, and then we would actually have more flexibility with the property. We wouldn't be tied into uh, a cul-de-sac, excuse me, my, um, um, we wouldn't be tied to cul-de-sac development. We wouldn't be, dis be tied to particular parcels in a particular division of the land. We could sell it to one owner, we could sell it to multiple, <coughs> but it would just open up flexibility on that project. And um, there is really no um, alternative for development of that property for which um, utilities, those utilities are not required to get to that point. So um, given the fact that we've met our Army Corps match, uh, more than met our Army Corps match, um, it seems like a win-win um, situation to be able to take that funding that, that Melissa and the Army Corps folks work very hard to compromise on and use funding that will not cause any, will not create any need for additional funding from the village to take those utilities from the center of East Dean and to, um, to, the, to the entrance of the, uh, of the, the development. Anything else? Um, I guess I was just gonna, uh, I don't know if there's any support for this, but I was gonna um, make a motion that we table the legislation and have a discussion about whether we should do this. Um, I know council seems to feel that we've had that, that discussion before, but I don't think citizens have felt uh, that, and I personally didn't feel we have had really a discussion about it. So, um, so I'm gonna make a motion that we table the legislation for this meeting, we have the discussion, and then uh, depending on how the discussion goes, bring the legislation back. Does, so, is there a second? Does, 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 that, does that mean if we table it now, we don't talk about it? No, no, we can talk about it. Well, we talk about whether we're going to table it. Right? <coughs> can we continue to have a discussion, Chris? I think it would be fair to talk about it. The motion's the table's been second, why you ought to table it. And that could encompass some of the things I believe you want to talk about. Okay. So is there a second? <coughs> I'll, I'll second that motion. So I then I would like to recommend that we have the discussion uh, about <coughs> how we want to go forward, and but just uh, pull the legislation depending on the discussion. Okay. So. Second. So we'll have, so we'll we're now have, have but we're now having discussion on the tabling of the motion, right? Yep. Which yep. can be so the reason that, but we don't take a vote on whether to table. We can discuss before we decide to table. Well, you, you, you're shaking your head. Yep. Well, I think you should go ahead and vote as to whether you're tabling or not tabling. Right. And included in the motion to table is the suggestion that you proceed with the we discussion. We should see our discussion on the table. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're voting. So we're voting. But we don't have to. Can't we talk about it before we vote? Because I think the discussion is going to be different if you know that you are proceeding with legislation as opposed to not proceeding with legislation. I, I would suggest that you decide on that motion before we vote. I would prefer to talk before we vote. Let's see. I, I, understand, what both, I understand what Judy's saying. Um, I, let's, we'll just go ahead and talk. We'll see how it goes. Thanks, Judy. I, I definitely understand. Oh, it's purely opinion, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, talk. About why the table? Just, I, what would that see? <laughs> I've got a, okay. Maybe I should pull off on the tabling 
That's what I was actually yes. wondering. Maybe uh, we should pull that off. Yeah, why don't we pull that back off? Why don't we go ahead and have the discussion? Um, and so we're going to rescind that motion? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I can go ahead and talk. Okay. Well, actually, do we want to hear yeah, okay. I think, yeah, okay. Well, I, I wrote up a piece uh, which some of you may have seen and not seen. Um, it, was, uh, it was with the legislation, so it wasn't out front. Um, and basically, I feel like it's hard to have an open discussion about a proposal with legislation sitting on the table ready to be voted upon. It doesn't feel like a lot of times when that happens that there's really space for a discussion. Um, it feels like, in a sense, the decision's already been made. Uh, so that was my reason for I feel like we needed some space to have a discussion about whether we should extend these utilities. Um, I have talked to several people who voted for the referendum and asked them, what, what, was, what did that vote mean to you? And um, it meant different things to different people. Some people, it definitely meant they want to see no development on the CBE. Um, some people that was not their position and some pretty, you know, some people who were leading the referendum and some people uh, who were, on, or Lori who was on the council previously, that was her point of view. Um, and uh, what I have heard regarding the need for this center for business and education to be made uh, available for some development that, that has, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me is that when we have business expanding, you know, uh, businesses in the village, which are uh, becoming stronger, have the need to expand, there's no place for them to go. This has happened on at least a handful of occasions in the past years. They had to leave the village, um, and that, and although we're we're all uh, very much for infill development, uh, there, it's limited. Uh, what infill development makes possible for an expanding business. Um, I think to be a sustainable community, I personally think we need a little more e economic activity in the village. Uh, it will make us more affordable. I think the issue of the, the cost of our utilities, the cost of expanding our uh, a new water plant and what that's needing for people's utility bills is one example of why a more economic development would be healthy for our community. Having more jobs in the village clearly makes us more sustainable. And um, But at the other hand, I don't think the CBE should be the center of what we're thinking about. It should, I, to me, it should be a piece. I would imagine it to, to develop over time as the need arises. Um, but I would hate to see it become the focus of economic development. I think that would be the wrong approach. And obviously, villagers need to have a lot of input about how we would move forward with the, C the Center for Business and that land and what we will do with it. Um, uh, the other thing, I think for me, for a lot of people who have worried about development in the Center for Business and Education, the big concern is that it won't stop there. Uh, it will keep going. We look around, you know, we look down at Fairborn, look at the edges of almost all communities. We're one of the few around the country. You come into the village, it's beautiful as you come in. There's not McDonald's and all this kind of sprawl, you know, development happening on the edges of our community. Um, and we have the Jacoby Greenbelt just beyond Center for Business and Education land uh, that we have a commitment as a community to preserve. And so I would like to see if we're going to go ahead with the extension of the utilities, that it be partnered with a commitment to strengthening the Green Space Fund that could put us in a strong position uh, should action be needed by the village uh, to, you know, some of that land came up for sale, that we would be in a strong position to make sure that it would be preserved. Um, I talked with Krista McGaw at the Tecumseh Land Trust about how could that be, you know, how could the village, uh, if one of the farms along, you know, passed uh, down in the Jacoby Greenbelt area would come up for sale, how can the village make sure that it is preserved and it doesn't end up being developed? 
and um, she's got some interesting ideas and she feels we can't be in a position but we are going to need some monies in place and committed uh, to make some of those options possible so um, I was recommending that if we go forward with the extension of the utilities that um, should the Sutton Farm agreement with the Glen Helen come to fruition what is that 160,000 so it's coming to village coffers I thought it was closer to two. Yeah, yeah, close to 200. Close to 200,000. We now have 190,000 in the green space fund. That would put us close to $400,000 in the green space fund. That starts to put us in a ballpark of where uh, we would probably need to be uh, should some of this other land come into play, that the village would be in a position to act to make sure that we can get the preservation that we've been committed to. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. I'll uh, we'll go next. Yeah. Okay. Let's just go down the line. Okay. Um, well, I see this as a multi phase process, and extending the utilities to that site I think makes sense, um, especially since there is money to do that. Um, and uh, I think it's a valuable piece of property. Um, but we don't know what will happen to it at this point. Um, but I do not uh, I, I do not support moving ahead on any kind of development on that property at this point. Um, I think that it was a very contentious issue about uh, whether or not to have the uh, CBE there and as Judith said there are some people who want to say cornfield and I mean, people are all over the map but when we take on this property, that means the village government will own it. That means that the village gets to decide basically what will be there. And I want us to take enough time to have community input into that so that we can, we can feel that a critical portion of the village is supportive of whatever gets decided to be done there. And I think that it makes sense, given that we have restarted the Economic Sustainability Commission, that they be tasked with um, starting to think about this, as well as starting to think about how the community can be involved in having input on that property. Um, I also I support what you said about starting to look at the Jacoby Greenbelt to make sure that we preserve that area. Um, and uh, it is my understanding that the um, CBE property is at the edge of the urban service boundary, which effectively determines the edge of the yellow border of Yellow Springs, and then preserving uh, farmland beyond that to the west. I think makes sense. Jerry. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it looks like. I as a council member and we as a council, we are accepting a piece of property from another organization. And we're going to be entrusted in handling that piece of property just like the rest of our pieces of property. Fortunately for us, we will be able to extend utilities to a piece of property that we now plan to take possession of. But that does not say right now that we plan to develop that piece of property. And since I only have another year left on the council, I don't see that happening in my term of council. And I don't plan on rerunning for council. So I feel it's an obligation not to prohibit a future council. So I'm in favor of extending that utilities up to the property line that we now are taking possession of and giving future councils the opportunity to discuss and determine what they want to do with that land versus having an additional burden on future councils in terms of having to come up with funds later to extend utilities to a piece of land that they own. And you have to, excuse me, I'm to do 
hear, so I'm hearing twice. But <laughs> in essence, I'm in favor, and, and I'm glad at the end of time that Tom um, did point out to us that we put infrastructure into a piece of land with no collection, no connection <laughs> to the best part of the time. Um, so I guess first of all, I want to say uh, I agree and appreciate all the points in Judith's letter. Um, but I guess what I am concerned about is I think we're conflating a decision about you know using a grant that we will lose versus a bigger decision that requires a lot of discussion, and that's all the development and what's going to fit with the village. So I want to separate those two. So in my mind, um, one of the issues here is about valuation of the property. If it is, if the utilities are not extended, the value, um, you know, based on the appraisal, is going to be quite different. Um, I agree with what Jerry said about uh, limiting future options, and, and this relates to what Dan said as well. I mean, we're not rushing into anything. We're allowing for opportunity, and there could be all different directions that we could go in. Um, so I think our decision on this is about, do we use the grant or do we lose it? And I guess one thing, Melissa, I want to clarify. So if we made a decision not to repurpose the grant, does that mean we get reimbursed the balance of the 97.5? I would need to ask that question. I, okay. haven't, I haven't asked that um, yet, so okay. I don't want to speak to that without getting a <coughs> or answer from that. Um, but that being said, you know, presumably maybe we could get 97.5 back, which is the 75%, you know, minus the 1300 or whatever, or we get 272,000 and we have a property that we could then do lots of different things with depending on what that is. Um, I also want to, a, a comment that was made in a correspondence that we received about this being about getting it off the books, that is not what this has been about. And the reason why Melissa and Denise have gone to so much effort is because again, what Jerry said, that we now have the funds that we could actually get that property ready for whatever we decide to do, whenever we decide to do it. Um, so I think that's enough. I mean, I just want to clarify that I think these are two very different kinds of decisions, and so we should focus on the grant. But they do have an obligation. The finding we do have an obligation to get it off the books to, to, to clarify. Right, but I just want to, but I just want to say that's not right. I, but that's not Melissa's motivation or right. Patty's or our village teams. Right. We're thinking about the bigger picture, <coughs> and that ultimately, I mean, I feel like we're all kind of in agreement, really. So it just comes down to. Are we going to use this grant, or are we going to lose it? That's what I think we need to decide. Right. I agree. I think I don't know that there is much more that I need to say that, that hasn't been said. Um, we will hear from citizens, Don, when we're when we're done talking here. Um, I don't. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Judith and I have talked about the the green belt. I think this actually starts to help reinforce that, and, and it gives us again. It's, it gives us um, it gives us money that. To help us do all of these other things, it gives us the opportunity for income. It gives us the opportunity um, to, to help support this community. Um, the one thing I will say related to you know decisions about about the property is we need to prioritize it because we have local businesses that are potentially in need of that property and and could potentially within a, within a couple of years be looking to move to that property. My biggest concern are those local businesses and making sure that that we're that we're not just sitting back, that we're doing, you know, we're being proactive to um, to work on on what would happen with that property. So um, we will open. I'll open. Uh, Dawn, I saw that you had a comment to make. I have just a quick question. Can you just come up? Of course. Um, I sort of feel like I'm your kind of your neighborhood planner because I brought a couple things to your attention about this project. First off, you didn't even know the subdivision had been hadn't been uh, registered with the county, and we brought that through process. And I brought to your attention that it wasn't water or sewer up to the driveway, and now this is happening now. So. 
is this grant really going away? Has someone from the Army Corps of Engineers told you specifically that this grant must be used within the next three months, two months, one year, four years? That's when, when, when you're, we will answer oh. all the oh, questions okay. that well, we that's, get. Well, that's okay. Okay. Now, as your quasi-planner, because you no longer have John on staff, Sorry, and I use talk to text to put this together so you'll find misspelled words. And we're supposed to read this? You don't have to. I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> okay, you have three minutes. Thank you. Then I'll get left in You want me to start a time over again here? I okay. know uh, that's okay. Keep going. Many good plans take several years before they reach their full life. The idea of the CBE has been around for many, over 15 years now. And while there have been fits and starts, the CBE has never really taken flight yet. But it's not for the lack of enthusiasm on the part of community resources, not to mention the countless staff and solicitors hours devoted to this 15-year-old idea. So why does this old idea keep bumping into <coughs> obstacles? Maybe it's just not right or maybe it never will be. So many assumptions that were used to bolster this old idea just aren't valid anymore. So why does council keep driving forward with something the community might reject? I, like your former assistant village manager, uphold the principles of certified planners, and it's my duty to speak out for the need of a new plan, not the rescoping of an old idea, rather one that takes into account current conditions and modern 21st century planning principles. I embrace smart growth as identified by the International City and County Management Association, and maybe you're familiar with this, Patty. It has 10 overarching principles for rural communities like ours, and four in particular stand out regarding this gateway property. Foster distinctive, attractive communities with a strong sense of place. Well, golly, we already have that. And adding a new development on the edge of town might stain that distinction and tarnish our rural character. Preserve open space, farms, natural beauty, and so forth. And once it's gone, it's gone. You can't bring it back. And a lot can happen on that property that might not require utilities. Strengthen and direct development to existing infrastructure. We talk about this infill and reuse of current space like like the bowling alley becoming the new brewery warehouse. Those are all good tenants of, that, of this property, but the fourth and the most important of all of these is to involve your whole community. This says growth can create great places to live and work if it responds to the community's sense of how and where it wants to grow. Don, you've got one more minute. The overwhelming response of the 2014 referendum went well beyond my expectations. And therefore, it should have been a signal to council that maybe a new vision is required for that property or the whole town, one that's responsive to the community's voice. And I find it discouraging that while you had John Young in your tenure, you didn't use his planning expertise or his real estate expertise to deliver that new vision to you. Instead, you had Miss Bates busily working away on this old idea. But especially now that the village owns the land or could own it here in a few, three um, we have a chance to create our own future there. Three years ago, council held us hostage with the threat of losing this grant. But lo and behold, that grant's still on the books and will be for quite some time, probably. Should it come out that the town wants to see brick and mortar there, then use the grant. But I beseech you, council, let your town decide its new vision and its plan for this important gateway and embrace these smart growth tenants. Be responsive to your community's voice and in good faith, your neighbor and certified planner. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, maybe I can, can say something that's a little bit simpler. I want to come back to what Judith was proposing about uh, when to act on this, which is different, I think, than how to act, ultimately. Right? It's, it's a matter of, um, the, the question of, of the, the timing seems important to me. 
I, I do appreciate uh, the, um, the work that staff did in, in you know, doing the audit of the books, exploring uh, the possibility of renegotiating uh, this grant opportunity with the Army Corps, which uh, was kind of, you know, was avoided three years back uh, as a complexity that couldn't be easily taken on. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's important to identify opportunities and know what they are and have them available uh, if the community and if the council decide to go in a direction that that supports the effort that ultimately uh, the council wants to go on. And the, the risk with this timing is to, you know, it's the, the sort of old saying about the tail wagging the dog, this, this grant and this utility opportunity could become, you know, could get out in front of the project and start to tell the project what it should be in, in a certain sense. And so in that regard, if it's possible to table this for some, even some months, while there's a community discussion about what to do with this property, it would seem to be prudent not to encumber the community with an obligation uh, that's complicated to modify again or to, you know, to adjust in some way. Um, and I mean, in a sense, something that it's occurring to me, and I, I don't know how uh, others feel about this, but you know, this might be a time to stop calling the property and the project the CBE. You know, start imagining this again. Start deciding what it is. And, you know, and then decide if this grant is something that serves me. So in that sense, tabling makes a lot of sense to me. And it doesn't really get in the way of any of the concerns that you guys have expressed, I think. Thank you. Anyone else? Chrissy? Okay. Um, I would like to support what Judith Hemphill said about, you know, tabling this. What's the rush? Because I, I realized then, I read the paper that supposedly the citizens have had enough time to talk about this, but I don't think that's true. And as someone who has been very involved with the CV, I have tried to, to keep track of it. After the referendum was passed, um, I noticed the CR wasn't even having meetings for a while. I emailed Jerry Sims, he was the liaison, to say, what's the deal with this? And I never heard anything back. Then I noticed that the CR was going to have some meetings, but they didn't want the liaison there. So again, I emailed Jerry Sims, what's the deal with that? I never heard anything back. Then when Brian became the liaison, he talked to me about that there were plans in motion, but really no firm ideas or anything, and then the, uh, nothing until the resolution was found in the packet last month, that, that there were new plans. So to me, I feel like clearly a lot of planning was being done, and it wasn't transparent, because as someone who keeps up with the CBE, I would, been, I would have noticed, I wouldn't have been so surprised by this. I also would like to definitely encourage Dan's idea that we think about this whole thing in a whole new way instead of it just being the Center for Business and Education, I, I, I think we should come up with new ideas because I don't think that one's working. It's been a long time and it's not any closer to fruition. I don't, uh, personally, I don't have a problem with extending the utilities out to the edge of the property. I think that was a great idea when Don Johnson proposed it in 2014. And for some reason then it wasn't a good idea, but now it is. So um, I'd like to know why that changed. And the last thing is, how can I be reassured as a citizen who does care about what happens at the CB that the, as we go forward with this, because clearly the council probably will, how there will be more transparency and how I can feel more like part of the decision making process and be more on top of it. Thanks, Chrissy. Anyone else? <coughs> Mariah. And station name. Mariah Jackson. Um, I'm new to this. This is the first council meeting I've been to since I was probably 15 when I came in here to talk about the community's paper. And as someone who has not been especially involved in CBE discussion, um, we're discussing transparency and that these utilities may be extended, but that that's not a statement that's saying we're going to develop this. But it is. Um, because if you're extending utilities to a space, what does that say? To me, who hasn't been a big part of that conversation and immediately sounds like the village and the council already has a plan. Not that it's a bad plan, but that it hasn't been left completely open to the citizens. Furthermore, I would say that I understand there's a time limit on things. It's really important to know whether this grant is going to be available to us again, if there's going to be other sources of money, um, and that we can't let the community 
to spend the next two, three years, however long, just trying to decide what they want to do. But to reiterate for the third or fourth time, the only way I've ever heard this discussed is in terms of the city, what it means. I've never had a community conversation about the land out there that didn't involve that original idea and what should we, we should do with it as a community. So I think that we really need time to kind of discuss that. Why would we extend utilities out there if we don't even have a plan yet, um, especially if the grant is going to be available or if there's another way to do that. So I think that um, Judith Hempflin was correct in saying there needs to be more discussion about that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Kate Hamilton. Um, one of the words that's a big buzzword for council and for anyone on a commission is transparency. And I don't feel like that was done here. Um, this seemed to have been done in a very, um, trying to find a positive word. Um, public money has been used on this for the past two years. I think council needs to be honest about that. There are lawyers' fees, there are people's hours, such as Melissa's. Um, all of that is public money, that counts. I've, I've worked on contracting departments and we had to map out what hours we used for each contract. So I think that the lawyers' yeah. fees, all the fees that have been spent on this need to be considered. Um, I don't think that it was a coincidence that this just came out of um, in the middle of the summertime, and then I was told that it was a rush, and that's why it had to go through. And then the following meeting, uh, you were all asked specifically, was this rushed by the Ohio Corps of Engineers? And the answer was no. And so that is why red flags came up for me, because I want to be able to trust council. Council represents all of us, and I don't feel that I should have to come to every meeting and look at every packet and find every, you know, little thing. I just happened to be looking at the packet to see if there was a meeting I'd be interested in, if there's a resolution. And I know for a fact you can't just put a resolution in like that without publicly um, letting the people know. So it was a way that was handled, was curious. And we have talked about the fact that it, the, the legislation about the Army Corps grant getting into the first packet was a mistake. It was an oversight by staff. Um, it, um, this is a real estate transaction. Real estate transactions are confidential by nature. It was the private seller. Um, Community Resources Board has responsibility to their current and past members. Um, that they don't have the same transparency requirements that council does. All decision making, so yes, there were discussions going on between community resources members and staff. Staff doesn't have the same requirements for um, open meetings that, that council does. Um, Brian and I were involved in meetings. Two council members are allowed to be involved in meetings. And again, when you're talking about real estate, that's not a surprise. Um, community resources asked for an extended period of, of privacy on this until they were able to communicate with their board members Sorry. current and past, and we honored that. Your time is up. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, I, you know, I don't. I so. A mistake and you know just things happening behind some things happening behind the scenes that's not unusual um, you know I it happens on a lot of projects where there is is work done by council members who are who are supporting a project and staff and other groups before it becomes public everything that has to do with decision making is being done in public that's why we're discussing it now and it will be a, um, it will be a public vote and a public decision. Um, and, and, you know, again, since I've, I've got old comp plans, this piece of property has been designated for commercial development since it was first recommended in 1992. It's been part of our comp plan since 1996, and it hasn't been removed from our comp plan. It's part of the visioning plan, so it was reaffirmed in 2010. 
it's it, it just it, it, it just hasn't changed. I mean, so many of the of the things that were that that um, were of a concern when the referendum came up. There's 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 a building with looking for tenants across the street. They're going to want that building. They can't lease that building, and so so nobody's going to want to come to the site. Well, somebody bought that building. So not only did somebody actually want to come to Yellow Springs and open a business they bought the whole building and we no longer have it available. Those tenants are, when their leases are up, are gonna be looking for a place to move. The bowling alley, that was the only option for Yellow Springs Brewery. If that piece of property had not been available, they would be in a property outside the village of Yellow Springs. And I, that is, that is something that I just, I, I don't think, I don't think, it, it, that's not sustainable for our for our community um, to not be able to support the business growth that we have. Um, so I I don't see a downside. I, I agree with Dan. I agree with Dawn that that maybe we can re we can revision re envision this property and this project. I don't see any re envisionment that doesn't benefit from us having those utilities. That are going to be paid for. What we've already theory? we've already paid the match. We've already made the match. I will ask Melissa. Will you? And please don't shout out. Sorry. Um, Melissa, will you address the Army Corps grant and your <coughs> your kind of gut feeling about it right now? Well, I do know that the the new project manager that I started working with um, probably a year or so ago when the transition from the old one to the new one occurred was she was tasked with um, you know, a list of open grants such as ours that she was supposed to um, help get moved along in the process. So definitive deadline, I have not been given one, but I do know that she was charged with um, taking older grants on the books such as ours and getting them moving again. So okay. I know that there, there is interest, so. Okay. Um. This is this is this is my okay. And if you want to make the motion, let me say something though. Is that, okay. And I want to say something else too. Um, is that I feel as if we we've had the discussion. I mean, we have all said that that there is nothing. We don't have any specific um, vision of what will happen on the Center for Business and Education, but that we are committed to seeing economic development to seeing to seeing something that's going to support the village of Yellow Springs and the fact that taking those utilities there are a it is the first step to get that to happen and I don't I don't personally see much of a downside to it um, because anything that happens there will require those utilities um, so you know I, I just I just want to make clear that I don't feel like we're, that's the only decision we're making here. And I think that that's something that Brian was saying. That is the only decision we're making. We're not making any decisions as to what we're going to do with the future of the CDE. Wait, let, let's, let's hear from Dino. I'm sorry. You know about that. Um, so it goes back to Brian. Before you put me on time, I just, it goes back to Brian with what Brian said. We're talking about just running the utilities on. That's it, nothing more, nothing less. And I could go on my litany of selling what the purpose of the, seat of the land is, and we can go into that. I will go into that, but that's all you're talking about right now and today is just pass the resolution to run the utilities. What comes of it next, that's all up to you guys. And it runs, and then it goes to course. Then it goes to the open discussion, then it comes as there's what's, who's gonna come in there, what do we want, that's when open discussion is gonna come into play. But right now, you're just running utilities. It's going to make it more viable, and it goes back to exactly what you said. You're just making it more viable, and we'll go from there. What's the hurry? Well, there is no hurry. You're just going to—it's just going to keep on. We'll just keep on renting it out to the farmers, and you'll just—you'll just make your money with the, with the CR made back with what the money is. You'll know, just keep on just renting that out, and you just get the money from it, and that's fine too. I mean, that's there's no hurry in it, but there's no there's nothing there's nothing that's going to be on the bad side of of Running the running the utilities to the spot. Now, dovetailing into what I wanted to talk about too. You can start my time. <laughs> 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 um, 
<laughs> what I wanted to go into the time was, you know, you got utility rates, you got property taxes, you got income taxes, you got all that that's there, that's continually rising, and purpose of CR or of not CR of this land is to give us some viable options down the road. Now that, again, selling it down the road. You know, median age here is 49. We all know that. The retirees aren't paying income tax. The, the village has to recoup some kind of taxes when they lose that, when they're losing that money. So how else do we recoup it? We're raising utility rates, you're raising you know property taxes are viable, income taxes are viable. Those are all viable ways to keep on redoing for the village. Um, by doing that though, you're losing your affordability. I mean, we've all talked about this before. You're losing affordability, whether you know it's affordable housing, whether it's renters, they're all getting hit. I mean, their affordable housing was set up with the intent of, that you're getting in a group that, that can get in there that has certain amounts that they meet the criteria of the amount of money that they'll be able to make. And now the backside of it, I don't know if that was ever considered. I don't know what we all thought about it, if it was considered on the backside of, of affordable housing. Oh yeah, what happens if the rent rate? What happens if the taxes raise? What happens if the utilities raise? What happens if this all happens? You put a stress, an undue stress, an undue stress and burden on those on that on that family. Same as with the renters. They're under, under you know, they're they get, they're carrying on a burden now of more, more on the backside, and they're not able to to get out of that system. They're just, we're stuck in that rut. You just keep on raising and you lose your affordability. And that's a big thing. That's what we all, all strive for. We're all looking for the affordability side of it. Um, you know, the government, as we all said, those government, we're not here to be proper. You're not looking to make money off this, uh, off this land. We're looking to bring business in, if that's the case, to bring business in. You're gonna be here to provide health, welfare, safety and infrastructure and other services provided. Well, this is going to give it to you. This is one option to give it to you. Our pie is only so big. We've got a pie of businesses that are only so big. The only place that you've got to grow, we, and we talked, I know what I meant with, with you guys, we've got nowhere else to grow. This is our only growth area that you can bring business in. So in that growth, you can make the pie bigger. If the pie becomes bigger, we're going to get more taxes, we're going to get, which could, could potentially offset residential taxes, could offset right, residential utilities. Those are all the benefits of getting a bigger pie because right now we just got a set pie. We can talk about we can talk about all the home you know home businesses, but that's never going to adequately supply tax revenue a tax revenue base to us. Um, you know those are the things that I am looking at that I look at in this side of it. Um, moreover, on a, on a better point, but, and we all talked about transparency. Goes to the village, you know, gets out of the CR, which was obviously a big problem back in the day. CR is out, so now you have transparency. You have the ultimate control of what type of business is going to come. That's in your best interest. It's in the village's best interest. And, you know, the folks get we all get to talk about it and see what's going on. Um, that's the direction I think we want to go in. Again, selling the selling the, the land for that purpose of bringing business in. Um, you know, we want affordability. These are the things that we need. This is the things that we want to go for. Uh, we're providing the solution with CR doing this and throwing this throwing this back over to the village. You've got the manpower, the knowledge to do it, to grow it, to find a, to find a way to do it. And more importantly, as Economic Sustainability Committee said, you don't want it to be sold. You know, they're, they're in favor of this, and you don't want it to be sold privately where you don't have control. Of it. And that's what's the most important, is that you guys have control. Thanks, Thanks for your time. I'd like to say, I'm um, First of all, it, it's, all, it's always sort of odd for me that um, if I were sitting out there, I would just be like one of you guys. But somehow, once we sit up here, there's some kind of sense, like there's some kind of hidden agenda, like we're hiding something, like there, there's something we're going to get out of something, which I don't get. I mean, yeah, you can look at the national level or the state level, but I mean, we are you, we're just sitting here. And I can tell you that there is no hidden agenda. There was no plan to try and get something through. Or if there was, at least I didn't know about it. About 15 years ago, there was a vote uh, about whether or not the village would donate some land for affordable housing on the last one. Some of you might have lived here then. 
I was the, the director of Home Inc. at the time, which wanted that land. And that vote was two to one against donating that land. So when the vote came up about the CBE and whether the citizens wanted the village to take out, prove the village taking out a loan to fund the infrastructure, I was pretty clear about how that vote was going to go. I was not surprised that it was two to one. That just seems to be how those votes go. I'm really hopeful by the time I leave council that, that at least there will be a plan for affordable housing. Uh, and um, so the reason why I support extending the utilities is one, there's money to do it. Two, well, I, I've said, I, I think I appreciate people saying we need to revision what's going to happen there. Yeah, we do. It's going to be our land, and we need to create a vision for what's going to happen there. But if there's something like, let's say, the medical facilities, as Karen said, that are in the Dayton Mailing Service building now, they need someplace to go. And I can tell you, having been on Home Inc., that we spent a lot of time looking for our empty infill spaces, and there are not many of them. That was just for housing, not business. So if there's some uh, business, uh, office, whatever in Yellow Springs that needs to go someplace, and they need to go someplace, and the utilities aren't there, what are they going to do? So that's why I think it's important to extend utilities, and then and we need to work on what we're going to do out there. I feel like uh, as a community, I mean, Mary Ann suggested that we have a discussion after this, dis after this decision about what to do with the land. It's pretty clear once the utilities go in, what's going to happen with the land. I agree with you. It's not an open-ended thing anymore. It's not going to go back to farmland. That's just not what's going to happen over time. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, a decision is being made beyond the utilities. A decision is being made that some kind of development will happen there. Time. The fact that there hasn't been enough time for citizens to talk to each other and to us about it, to me, makes it, uh, I mean, the, the feeling of lack of transparency. I don't think citizens were aware, I was not really aware of how, this, when this, how quickly this decision, I don't think anybody was trying to hide anything. I think it just, you know, the people that were in discussion with CR were in the know and they were allowed to do that. They are allowed to do that. Two people can have these private conversations and they're kind of necessary sometimes for things to move forward. But um, but the rest of us weren't a part of that and so I think there was just a mis, uh, mis sense of the fact that the rest of us weren't that aware of this what was happening. So all of a sudden it's here and the decisions to be made. I appreciated what Mariah said about, you know, you're making a decision by putting in the infrastructure. It's more than about the infrastructure. But I think there's there's a good discussion to have about why some development out there might be a good thing. But I think we need a little time to talk about it. We're not going to figure out all the details, what Dan's talking about at this new plan. It's a great, I mean, I love what you said. I like what almost everybody has said. You know, I, I know where you're coming from and it makes sense to me. But there needs to be time. And I don't think it has to go on for months. And I think we have the time. I don't think we're gonna lose the grant money. I think we could take another, at least another discussion or two, maybe just even one more discussion to have people have some time to talk to each other, put some letters in the paper. Uh, I just feel like it's just too fast and people didn't feel they had enough time to really think about it. When people start thinking about our, our own businesses that may have to move out of town, I mean, that's the thing that sort of starts to catch me. If I don't have to worry about the Jacoby Greenpelt, you know, this straw development rushing down the road, if we are really committed and we're going to put something in place, we haven't even had time to discuss it. You know, I've kind of thrown that out tonight. I put it in the packet. There hasn't been any time for the community to really think about it. I feel like if we just give our, if we give the community a little bit longer to think about it, I think people are going to be more comfortable. I, this money is here. I think I'm. I think right now you might convince me differently, but there's been no time for you to even try to convince me differently. You know, there's just been no time. 
So that's where I think giving it a little more space, at least one more meeting um, to hold off on this resolution, um, you know, to give people a chance to have these conversations. And like I say, there's people I talk to because I called them and I said, so what did you mean by voting for the referendum? Did, was that really, does that mean you were totally, and some people that clearly was their position. It used to be my position. My position has changed um, in terms of having some development. I, I, and especially I'm concerned about our own businesses that are expanding and having to move out of town. I don't like that idea. They become more successful and then they have to move. And for our, for the sake of, you know, we, we if we have a little more help with our, the supporting our utilities, you know, the federal and state government doesn't give us any money anymore to put in a water system, to put in, you know, it's, it's horrible. We're expected to do it all by ourselves, basically, you know, to pay for it. And we're, and you know, our costs are gonna go through the roof. And so I think we have to be, you know, aware of, you know, these very practical, even if we can change things nationally in terms of, you know, what's going on politically. So that, you know, we used to get money, there used to be grant money for infrastructure. The whole country is in crisis with their infrastructure. And we're putting in a new water plant, it's extremely expensive. And our bills are gonna be going up 30% this year, 30% next year, 10% after that. I mean, for some people this is gonna be, you know, I mean, we're all gonna have, to, for those who really have financial problems, we're gonna have to conserve like crazy in order to be able to afford to stay here. But it does help if we keep these businesses that are growing, especially, they're the ones I care most about, in the village. But we need time to, I feel like if we could just postpone this vote, at least till the next meeting, to have time to talk to each other about why, what makes sense. Yes, we need to revision it, but putting this infrastructure in place says we're going down a certain path, and let's just be honest about it, that's the truth. But, um, but it's, you know, but I think we need a little time just to think it through and have time to talk to each other about it. And, uh, and then that larger plan of what to do with it, if we do go forward with the infrastructure, we need, there'll be some time, we need some time to, for the whole village to be involved. But I think if there are businesses that are gonna need to be leaving in a year or two that, that uh, Karen may be <coughs> aware of, well, we need to find a way to make a space for them. And who wants to have to drive out of town to go to the doctor's office or something like that? You know, we need some space for these kind of services in our village. And um, so, so I want to propose that we table it, table this resolution, uh, and uh, bring it back. To, you know, put it on the agenda next week. You guys already have a motion on the floor. Oh, so, yeah. okay. Well, I, I kind of rescinded, rescinded it. We did rescind it. Well, we kind of rescinded it. So I'm sorry. We're rescinding it, but it, it's actually still on the table. I mean, I, I do want to, I feel like, I know we've discussed this for a while, but some things have been said that I, I just don't want to leave this discussion without responding to. Um, one of those being, you know, again, this discussion, and I understand and I appreciate the sentiments which are going to inform my decision about what we do with the property. But to use words like extending the utilities to the edge is an encumbrance, to talk about things like we're not being transparent, we're, we're moving away again from what this decision is about. And I, I disagree that the small imprint of moving, you know, water and sewer and having the stormwater taken care of is in any way making this big decision about the property. Yes, we have all agreed that some kind of economic development is in our thinking, but you know, to, to again make it this big, I'm gonna say dramatic, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be pejorative, but I, I think we're losing focus of the discussion, and specifically on transparency. As Karen said, there was a real estate issue, and as we see in the report that was put together, we were it was not confirmed until June that that transfer was gonna happen. So I understand that, yes, that hadn't been talked about extensively. But in terms of repurposing the grant, this is something I had asked about a long time ago in meetings. We knew that Melissa and Denise were working on this, so this is not something that's brand new. And again, I just want the decision to be more of a factual one about are we gonna use this grant 
or not. And so I, I think all the other issues, I agree with just about everything else I've heard tonight. Smart growth, yes. New vision, yes. Us being you know, not transparent, no way, all right? Th these are things that have been out there. And you know, again, there's not a hidden plot. This is simp simply, is it logical to use this money now for potential opportunities? We're not going to be changing the imprint out there by bringing water sewer to the edge of the road. I, I feel as if we've had a, a very robust discussion tonight. I think I think tonight has been a good discussion with the community and on council. I, I'm not sure what extra time. I mean, I guess we have a motion on the table on the floor. We need to vote on that motion. Um, so the motion is to is to table. So there's a motion to table. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. So. Okay. So. So I guess we're ready to take the vote. Yep. Yeah. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Would you just go over okay. what we're taking? We are voting on accepting a grant from the Army Corps of Engineers for infrastructure improvement to the entrance of the land known as the Center for Business and Education. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I'll abstain. Uh, next piece of legislation is, uh, re is, is resolution 2016-41, title only please. This is consenting to the annexation of 422.106 acres of land, more or less, in Miami Township, Green County, Ohio, to the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, pursuant to a petition filed with the Board of County Commissioners of Green County, Ohio, as provided by Ohio Revised Code Section 709.023C. Um, so this is, I don't know, Chris, if you need to see, this is basically us, this is, this is the annexation of um, 4.22 acres of the Glen. It has, oh, can I get a motion? I said 422. I did say that. Okay, we have first and second. Okay. Um, so it's about annexing um, 422 acres of the Glen. Um, we've gone through the process here of accepting and saying we'll do that. It's gone before the county commissioners and they have approved it, so now it's coming back to us um, to basically say we're accepting it. Um, anything else needs to be said, Chris? No. Um, any questions or comments from anyone? Um, I, I'm getting some of my uh, papers mixed up here. Uh, so maybe what I'm going to ask about is not for this resolution, but 2016-44. Um, and I'm going to actually ask that that be read next. Is that? For this pro property? Yes. Well, um, I have some concerns about that resolution, which... Okay, then, I mean, can we go ahead and do this one? Well... Is that going to... It does impact this one. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather say my concern. Okay, go ahead. Because it, it indicates that not only will we be providing law enforcement, which was my understanding of why we were doing this, but also it says recreational programming. Um, uh, well, it just lists a whole bunch of other things, extending sewer and electricity, and I thought none of that was that one. So we I'm talked sorry. about this, but we we've, we've already put that to rest. It was, it was that it's required to put it in there. And, and then, um, Chris, we're going to put it in there. And we have to think about it. Yeah, and if you look at section one of that uh, resolution 2016-44, it it's also says or made available. So it's not to provide it necessarily, but it's available if appropriate. Exactly. When we talk about this, I in particular had an issue with recreation programming and what we need to be doing. And so, you know, Nick, you know, made the comment that obviously they wouldn't need the village for that because they have their own. But that's when it came up that this is sort of, to, you know, boiler yeah, plate. Yeah, I guess I just didn't remember seeing this written all the way out. 
I think we're already providing some some utility services out there. We are to some area. We are providing some utility services, and this this was a concern that Jerry had, had early on. Um, Technically, we are required by law, as Chris said, to make the utilities available to them. Um, that doesn't mean we have to run the lines out to them for water and sewer and all of that. And it was part of the discussion that we had with Nick, um, but that is not an expectation uh, that one has. So. But it, it's potentially an opportunity. I mean, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a negative anyway, as long as we're, as, as long as we're not Putting the bill, but um, so are you? Are you going to be okay with this first one? Are you okay? No. Uh, is, is this why you're not uh, okay? Yeah. I, my, me. Um, it's it's land that we're getting from the land we're not getting. We're not getting from an individual so an individual can say anything but in the future for the bill of the organization can say something else and that's what my concern is, is you know i can stand up and say today i because i'm the director i'm going to want it but what does the future hold? but I'm but not, i i'm not going to i'm not going to that right but i think given the fact that, that this land has a conservation easement on it. I think that there, there, there isn't going to be a lot of development pressure. I mean, I don't think that it's not going to become a residential development that would need recreational facilities. I, I think that there's probably less risk with this piece of property than there would be um, with, or with this annexation than there might be with other potential annexations. Jimmy, Chris, can you just maybe clarify like what is the implication of, of this? You know, so I mean, let's just pick apart recreation programming. I mean, does that mean we have to? I mean, do we have to create a special program, or it's just? I mean, what the village offers, you have access to. I mean, what does this actually mean? The latter, what the village offers, you have access to. I mean, the idea being is that. Remove the, the context of the land, which has restrictions on the use of the land because of the conservation easements, et cetera, et cetera. The, if another piece of land were brought in under an equal protection theory, the property owners would have the rights to the same privileges that other villagers would have. So in the context of the Glen, it's different because everyone knows what the Glen is, Glen is for. Part of this plan to annex was related to a a furtherance of the goal of conservation of the property and this is standard language that one sees in, in annexations I mean boilerplate language uh, because the expectation is that if the community is going to annex they have to provide services as the quid pro quo for getting that land in. so let's say currently like street lighting is here can I demand that a street light is put in front of my house from the village? Well, well let's put it this way. Uh, if, if you want to pay for it, that, I mean, that's part of the discussion. Okay. So it doesn't come for free. Right. I mean, even when we're talking about utilities, water and sewer, as I said, they have some, some utilities out there already. It doesn't say that we're going to extend those lines. And again, you know, we're actually, you know, wanting, I mean, I don't, it's in the village now. I don't know that we would have a problem extending utilities there if there was you know if, if they paid for it so and 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 we'd have more customers just like we were talking about with the center for business and education we, it would it would potentially give us more um revenue from those utilities so i don't necessarily see that as a negative um and the parks i mean i i don't i can't imagine the recreational services i mean we don't have parks everywhere in the village we have uh, a couple of them, <laughs> you know. I mean, so so that certainly isn't something we have to provide. We don't provide recreational services other than a couple of parks. So okay, so we can go. Let's go back to the other. One. Are we back? Back on forty one. That's basically just accepting the annexation. Um, any other comments or questions? Citizens, comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So let's go ahead and read 44, Judy. This is <clears throat> adopting a statement indicating this 
Services, the Village of, of Yellow Springs, Ohio, will provide to the territory proposed to be annexed to the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, pursuant to a petition filed with the Board of County Commissioners of Green County, Ohio, filed by the petitioner, Antioch College Corporation, the annexation of 420, 422.106 acres of land, more or less, in Miami Township, Green County, Ohio, to the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, as provided by Ohio Revised Code Section 709.023C. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Um, I think we had that discussion. <laughs> Any other comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now we'll go back to resolution 2016-42. Entirely or title? Uh, just entitled. This is authorizing the village manager to submit an application to the Yellow Springs Community, F Community Foundation to support the cost of the fiber needs assessment. Can I have a motion, please? Second. Patty? Um, as council knows, we issued an RFP for a fiber needs assessment, um, and this is a grant to the Yellow Springs Community Foundation to help pay the cost of um, that needs assessment for our, the development of our own municipal fiber system. The, uh, the RFPs are out and in fact are due on uh, Monday. So hopefully we'll have some, some news about that, possibly at the meeting on the 6th, um, but certainly by the 15th of uh, the second meeting in September. But this, this is, in fact, a resolution allowing you to apply for the grant. <coughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Um, I guess I would just like to highlight why I think this really does make sense as, you know, applying for a grant, because the whole reason that we're thinking about municipal fiber is to improve quality of life. We're thinking a lot about uh, folks in town that have difficulty affording what has become a critical I mean, it, it's a utility, just like water and electric. You need to have internet. And also, uh, you know, we've, Mario and the schools have really, uh, I'm sorry, Superintendent Basora and the schools have really uh, uh, supported this idea to support students' education because right now the infrastructure we have is, is poor. And we want to stay up with, you know, the movements of technology. So. Um, I just wanted to say I think this is an excellent idea, Patty. It fits with the mission of the Community Foundation. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I, did, I just wanted to thank Patty, you know, for you thinking of this. I think it's a great idea. Okay, um, all those in favor? Um, but if, if we don't get the grant, it's still one forward, right? Right, we've already issued the RFP. That's what I, that's what right. I thought. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so, it, it's a, you know, it's a good idea if, if we get it. If not, I want people to know we obligate ourselves to do, to, to do this. So. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And finally, 43 by title only. Judy? Yes, this is authorizing the village manager to designate the authorized representative and authorized alternative alternate representative to serve for the Village of Yellow Springs on various committees of the Board of Trustees of American Municipal Power Incorporated. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Patty? Um, I received an email from um, AMP's legal counsel. Um, occasionally they want to update the village's um, authorizations for uh, representatives who can attend the meetings both on our different projects, um, those types of things. They would like us to update them, and I have several other documents that I have to fill out once this resolution is passed. But um, essentially, it would name myself as the first representative and Johnny as the second representative in my absence um, to attend the meetings of AMP. Um, they call them periodically for different projects. For instance, we had one Wednesday on the Hydro project, which Johnny is going to try to attend um, because I have another uh, engagement at the same time. So um, that's simply all this does is update those authorized representatives. Mm -hmm. okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you all. Lots of legislation. Um, next item on the agenda is citizens' concerns, where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. And uh, we ask you to come to the podium <coughs> in uh, three minutes to speak. I know I've heard some uh, talk in the past about upgrading the 
toddler playground that's out here by the skate park. Um, I, I would like to be involved in that. I have um, spent a lot of time on that playground, as has my husband in the past five years, and um, we watched it deteriorate. And um, if, if there's something I can do to help, I would like to be involved. Well, I appreciate that. Um, we've actually ordered the, the equipment already. We're waiting on it to be delivered and installed. It's through a nature works group. Um, and so it, it's it's already in progress. It's, it's something, in fact, Jason had emailed me about um, maybe a week or 10 days ago that we're, we're just waiting on the, the, the new playground equipment to get in and then what's there will come out and new, new will be installed. How can citizens be involved? Um, well, at this point, um, I'm not sure. It was brought last year um, as a as a project and a grant application <coughs> for council, and, and at this point, it's just a matter of waiting on it to come and be installed by the company. So then we'll come and enjoy. It. Yeah. Well, I was going to say actually. I mean, I don't. You know, depending on if we're thinking about what happens next after the equipment's in place, uh, you know, service or whatever, that's under the purview of the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, so coming to a meeting and discussing, that was the same commission that you know, handled the uh, skate park upgrades. So you know, if we have some ideas about how to further enhance it, that would be that would be the place to start. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, John. Related, related to that, someone had uh, uh, asked me about the water fountains or the drinking fountains, um, and. Is there one there? There's one at the train station. And that they're not, the they're not working yet. Yeah. Um, just wondering if. Right, I believe Karen has spoken to, to Jason about that one at the train station, and we're hoping to get that replaced soon. And, there, and there's one at the toddler. Is there one there? Is there one? There used to be one. There used to be one. I don't, I don't, I don't think it works. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, I will make a note. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, I don't know if it's appropriate for a council member to express a citizen's concern. Go ahead. But, uh, and this is serious. School, school is starting, and, and West South College is the main thoroughfare for most of our students and parents traveling to and from the high school. And, and we saw it last year, and I'm sure in the moment, as police can attest, we have bicycles. We have skateboarders and we have traffic cars going to and from. And to me, it's an accident waiting to happen. The, the street is not marked, so consequently, motorists are driving on both left and right hand side of the street, especially when they encounter skateboarders and kids on bicycles. So I would like for Phyllis and the police to take a look at that to see how we can, can correct, correct that issue. At striking it or marking it? Well, well no, I, I don't have a solution. I, okay. I, I want to leave it up to, to the ex, experts. Well, and Jerry's mentioned before, you know, just can we do better surfacing of those, you know, paths that are currently right. there? And but but my, my, more my concern is people going left and right because there is no market. So it kind of says you can drive down anywhere in, the, in that highway. And, and, and that's where the problem usually comes up. And and the bikes, I mean, the, as it gets later in the season, um, the kids need bike bikes. I'm wondering if we can get some bike bikes, especially out to the high school, because those kids, it's, it's dark sometimes when they go in the morning. Um, yeah. That would be helpful. Well, but, you know, like I say, to me, I think it's a it's, because the Skateboards yeah, are another more, story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are hard. Yes, yeah. but we, we have more and more new families moving into the community that, that are accustomed to right. our way of living, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And, uh, yeah. that, that's my concern. I wonder though, with uh, Brian bringing up the, you know, there's the, the sidewalk and then there's that old bike path. That right. is what it was. I don't know if there is something simple that could be done for. Well, I had talked to Jason about potentially putting because Jerry had brought that up once before, and I had talked to Jason about potentially putting something in his budget to try to, to resurface that so it was um, 
available for the bicycles and, and skateboarders and, and as opposed and then the sidewalk is there for pedestrians. Yeah. I don't think they'll use it. Before we do that, I would like to have some conversation with the students to find out if they need to use it. I think that they will stay in the street. I think that, and I just, I just think they will. I think they'll ride in the street. They ride their bikes and their skateboards down the middle of Zinia Avenue. So I don't know why they would. Well, they're not allowed to use the sidewalks in downtown. Well, they're not allowed to use the sidewalks anywhere. Sidewalks, you're not allowed. Right, so that's why no they're not using that. But I'm allowed saying in that, area, in that area, they've got that sector. You know, it seems to me like some of it. Well, well I, I do wonder just because I mostly bike, and I mean, it, you can't bike on those. I mean, they're, you know, it's they're just all I, cracked. And I would, I would like some, before we just put money into asphalt, right. I would like to look at those. And I, I mean, I unless we can do it really inexpensively. Um, I just don't know that I think those are the best solutions, that those separate, that, you know, it's not really proper protocol right now in these days for bike, for cycling. I mean, I think they're, they're not contiguous, they're, um, they're not really connected into anything. Well, my thought would be start with Eric over, have him take a look. Yeah. And uh, bump and Chris for that matter. So yeah, I'm not um, even sure how you get on them. I mean, I, if you're coming from down Zine Avenue, I don't even know how you act would access it. So I just, I mean, I would like to find a cycling expert to yes. look at it. Yes, I think that's a good start. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, moving on, uh, the next item of business is the utility rate discussion. Um, I expect that a lot of the folks are here to talk about that. Um, we obviously uh, have heard a lot from a lot of citizens um, about it. Um, I know that um, our staff, our finance staff, has been um, fielding a lot of phone calls. Um, they've been working really hard. Melissa provided some amazing documentation, answers to a lot of questions, uh, process document, um, going through, you know, everything, a timeline of decision making on the uh, on the rate increases. Um, so, um, you know, the one thing I would I would say we actually have a couple of experts here, so we'll want to hear from them. Um, what I would really like to say, first of all, though, is is to please, um, we appreciate that the people that are that are coming and calling staff and and trying to get answers to their questions, but. Um, just be kind when you talk to them, please, and um, to um, understand that they're that they're as anxious as as, they, as you are to get answers to questions. They want to answer your questions. They want to help you out, and um, that that's what they're there to do. So um, I will turn this over to Melissa to go through all of the work she put together um, about this subject. Okay, so I have provided a number of materials that were in the packet, um, and I'm just going to um, touch on each of those briefly. Um, I know that this discussion is kind of twofold, um, the utility billing and kind of what's been going on within the office and the changes in the system that have caused a few glitches um, in the last seven months with all the changes and then the rates. So this is kind of two different things. So. Um, I'm going to uh, go through everything that was put in the packet, um, some, some touches on the rates, some touches on the um, utility billing uh, software changes. Um, the first thing that I put in the packet was a, a history of the uh, three enterprise funds so that we can kind of see um, where each of the funds um, were at the beginning and end of, uh, let's see, 2010 to 2015, and uh, it also included 2016, which was projected. So it shows the electric water and sewer and uh, those funds and um, what kind of happened with them. And then I have a uh, rate increase timeline for a, a different page for each of the uh, utilities. So we have one as it pertains to the electric and um, I know that when we were having all of these discussions regarding the electric rates, um, we were throwing around the number of, you know, the rate hasn't been changed in 20 years. We never had our hands on the actual ordinance and uh, Judy and Kathy and I did a little bit of digging last week and we did get our hands on that actual um, ordinance 
um, and it was dated September 7th, 1982. So those were the same rates that were in effect until we changed those in April of this year. So this is a much shorter timeline because there has been no change in 34 years until uh, the present year. Um, the second timeline is uh, as it relates to the water. Um, I took this one back to 1997 um, when the first five-year rate increase uh, was was put into place by council. Um, we did a uh, another rate study back in 2008 by a firm uh, called Wolpert, and in 2009 um, there was a recommendation that Wolpert gave. Um, they gave four options to council, um, anywhere between do nothing um, all the way up to just you know do one increase, do multi-year increases, different rates. Um, so council then in 2009 took the, um, the recommendations given by Woolpert and they decided on a five-year ordinance, um, which was actually, it actually coincided with option number three that Woolpert um, had presented, which was on that timeline um, in the packet. So um, there was another five-year ordinance in 2009 that went into effect for um, January 1st. And, um, then what happened um, in 2014, there was another ordinance that was passed effective April 1st, um, and it was an 11% increase instead of the 3% increase, which was originally passed with the December 2009 ordinance. Um, there was another ordinance in 2015, which raised them again 10%, and then there was another rate study that was done by the Rural Community Assistance Program. and. Um, Council, council held a work session to discuss that and then in 2015, November 2015, they uh, passed the last rate, uh, the rate increase ordinance in which um, we are feeling the effects of today. So that began in January of 2016. It is important though to note that um, we were still on a quarterly billing system back then and since we bill in arrears, April, the April billing that everybody got um, would have been the first real full one. So that would have been for January, February, and March. Um, so that would have been the first full uh, re realization of the rate increase, which a lot of people didn't notice uh, at the beginning of the year because of that quarterly billing system. So again, um, the, the sewer uh, timeline kind of coincides with the water. This one was taken back to 1990. Um, um, it is important to note, though, that there was an increase in, for one year in 1990. Then again, there was another increase for one year in 1992. So there was a year gap in between increases. And then from 1992 to 2001, there were no rate increases. Um, and then in 2001, they did another five year, or they did a five year uh, increase, uh, 2002. They repealed uh, the 2001 ordinance and they decided not to increase it for another year. So the five year that they put in place, they decided that they were only going to, um, that they were gonna extend the first year of that again into a second year, um, 2004. Um, they were going to push it to January instead of August, a rate increase. And then the Wolpert uh, study came into play and they presented their findings to council and council took no action. Um, they decided to do nothing and no increases. So then uh, RCAP came in um, in September of 2015. They did the water and sewer increase and uh, council took their recommendations and put in place a five-year ordinance um, in November um, to start in January and again that realization would have that full realization would have happened in um, April for most folks um, the next thing um, that's in the packet is utility billing uh, changes and moving forward um, I color-coded this uh, for ease of reading water is blue electric is red and things that were very general that applied to all the utilities were uh, put in black um, so it, it goes through what changes in the utilities have occurred since just since January. In January, we had the water and the sewer rate increases that went into effect. Um, also in January, we had an electric meter change out program or a project that started to replace 2100, uh, almost 2200 meters in, in the village. Um, and then in February, um, there was, I don't know if I should even go through this entire timeline. Do you, do you all want me to go through all of it? Okay. Basically what this says is there was an, um, a tremendous amount of change within the utility office in seven months. And as a result, um, we have a very archaic billing software. If anybody has ever asked to see their history printout, 
I literally, I and the other two clerks will take a highlighter and color code it so that you can even read it because it's really difficult to read. Um, so our utility billing software is very dated. Um, we put a massive amount of change on this billing system in a very short period of time and um, we followed very close instructions by our utility software company when we were making these changes to what needed to be done in the system and lo and behold something on a back end somewhere would go awry um, that we wouldn't be able to identify until you know we were running the bills um, and you know a lot of people say well can't you catch that before you send the bills out we would run uh, what's called a trial billing, where we that's our that's our trial run, um, and we would look at the bills, calculate them out, everything looked fine. As soon as we hit basically the go button to make them an actual, we'd have issues. So we couldn't even detect them in the trial billing. So I think that there was one month back in, I think it was March, people got two bills um, because we would catch them after they went out, and we would have to redo them. So there's there's a whole timeline, um, but that's kind of the long and the short of it. Um, I also have another document in here about um, if you have concerns for your utility bill. And I know that a lot of people submitted their utility bills in the packet and um, unfortunately we can't go through all those individual utility bills um, in, in this um, space today, but um, I did have the utility billing clerks look at all the bills that were submitted and they are calculating right. Um, and that should always be everyone's first stop is to to call in or to visit the utility billing office. We do have extended hours. Um, they are answering um, customers coming in in person from 8 to 3, but they do answer phone calls from 7.30 to 3.30 p.m. Bills were due today, and I think it is important to note that um, when I touched base with them downstairs before I had to come up here, they had 68 messages on the phone because there was a steady stream of people. And so if you tried to call today and you had a question about your bill, um, they will get back with you tomorrow. But there was a, a line of people all, all day long from 8 to 3 today, so or actually until 6 today. So if you did try to call today, they will get back with you. So first stop is to, to get a hold of them. Uh, they'll, they'll look at your bill. They'll recalculate it. Um, we I created an Excel spreadsheet that shows all of the math and calculations behind somebody's utility bill if they don't understand how to calculate it on their own or they want to see our math and how we got to that bottom line. Um, we've also been sending out meter readers and um, electric and water crew staff um, for three weeks straight uh, rereading meters because people feel like some of their readings may have been off. Um, so we've been we've been doing that, and we, we have found where some um, some meter readings you know did need to be adjusted. One of the main reasons that we found that affected a lot of people is if your account number started with a three and um, your meter was not read in June, which should have been your catch-up bill. If it was not read in June, your July bill that you got in the August 1st uh, mailing, um, if, if you weren't read, it, it estimated based off of that quarterly read. So it was higher and it was, it was estimating off of a three month read. So um, we've been able to explain that to a lot of people. We've told them they can either pay it and until their actual reading exceeds that number that was on their bill, then they'll just get the readiness for service charge if they wanted it back down because um, you know they just, didn't, weren't able to pay that much up front, then, then we were uh, able to adjust those accounts accordingly. Um, but if you are not able to get um, a satisfactory um, you know, solution to your questions um, from the utility billing clerks or myself, um, then there is the Utility Dispute Resolution Board. So um, we do encourage folks, if they feel like they are not able to um, get any kind of a um, answer that they feel is satisfactory to take that, uh, to use that ad avenue. Um, I also put in here information about uh, resources if you do have trouble paying your utility bill. We do offer payment agreements for people. Um, if you do have difficulty, um, you just need to come into the office, there's a one-page form, you fill it out, and um, that will space out your utility, the, the amount of your utility bill that you're having difficulty with over, you know, a uh, mutually agreed upon timeline. We do have um, level billing that we offer for all of our utilities now. We didn't offer it for water and sewer because on the quarterly system, it was basically a level billing um, where you were billed the same amount for three months until you were ready again and then caught up. We also have a, a whole list of external agencies that are able to offer assistance as well. That information is also on our website that you can take a look at. Um, but I do want to note that um, the, the clerks down there work really hard and the system that we are working within has been very difficult and unable to handle a lot of this change. And 
our goal is for those bills to be 100% accurate all the time. And if we feel like there's any type of issue, we identify it as soon as we can, we fix it. Um, we noticed that there was a slight issue that affected about 100 customers, between 75 and 100 customers uh, this month where um, their bills were a little bit high um, and it was because if they weren't read in June, they were Route 3, um, the amounts that they were paying towards um, their, their bill, those estimated months, um, it wasn't all of them, but it was just some of them, um, the credits were erased from the system. We were able to identify that when one customer came up, questioned their bill, we found that. We went through every single account, we fixed all of them, we sent letters out to everybody indicating the credit that they were going to receive on their bill. So, I mean, we're working really hard down there to make sure that everything is accurate, but I mean, we have had a few bumps in the road with all the changes to the system, but first stop is always to come down, talk to us, and we're, we're trying our hardest to uh, rectify everything. And everybody that's came down is left happy, so I can say that. Um, there's also some information in there about calculating your utility bill. I actually did a, I had to do a seminar on this one time um, because when it, we were on the quarterly system, it was impossible to calculate your water and your sewer on your own. It was incredibly difficult. Um, so I do have um, the understanding your water and sewer bill, the old document that um, we were using for those that are still interested in calculating uh, their quarterly bills because a lot of people are comparing their quarterly bills to their monthly bills right now. Um, so I did include that document, which I think it's like five pages long, um, how to calculate your current utility bill under the new monthly system for electric water and sewer to one page. Super easy. Um, so all of that information is in here for you. Um, I think that the last point that I really want to express is a lot of people are saying the increase isn't 30% for water. The increase for me was like 300%. Um, and a lot of those people um, were comparing their quarterly bill to their monthly bill. It's important to note that if somebody used 3,000 gallons under the quarterly billing system, they were only being billed for uh, they were only being billed for a thousand gallons each of those three months. So that 3,000 was spread over three months. So you were only paying a thousand for each of those three months. And they are comparing those bills to if they used 3,000 in the monthly system, that's one, it's triple the usage, and two, you're paying that all at one time versus paying a third of it as you were under the quarterly system. So um, I know that some of the people that had submitted their uh, utility bills into the packet, that was the case. They were comparing a quarterly bill of the same usage to a monthly bill of the same usage. Um, and everybody that did submit their bills in the packet did calculate correctly, so I don't know if I mentioned that before. So. I know that I've went on and on about this. Um, there's a lot of information in the packet. I've been explaining this to people, um, you know, for three weeks now. So um, I'm fully prepared to take any questions that anybody would have, citizens or council. Council, questions? Yes, Councilman Bowman. Um, John Courtney is here because um, there's also been some some question about the electric rate increase because it's the electric rate is much more complicated than, than the water rate so we asked John because he's the one that did the report that did the recommendation um, for um, a couple of things one to go to a flat rate um, where we had a tiered rate previously and the other um, is uh, just just the, the rate increase in order to get our um, our electric utility back into the black it had been running in the red for two or three years so um, we needed to get it back into the black so um, John could you just take a couple of minutes and just talk about what goes into that electric rate yeah sure um, and I think maybe uh, from reading some of the, uh, uh, the correspondence the council received I think probably uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, you know, points of confusion is the fact that, and I think you've actually got the old rate up there on the screen, uh, your old rates, which again hadn't been changed for 30 some odd years, uh, with the exception of the power cost adjustment, um, your power cost adjustment was projected to be in the neighborhood of roughly four cents, which is actually almost where it would have been this month had you not changed the rates. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the things you did as part of the rate change was to roll that power cost adjustment into the base rates and get it back down around zero. Um, and so when people look at the base rates, the old base rates that were, you know, seven cents, six cents, five cents, you need to keep in mind the fact that on top of that, they were also paying a power cost adjustment that would have been nearly four cents a kilowatt hour this month. 
Um, and under the new rates, that power cost adjustment is actually a negative two tenths of a cent. So, so even though the base rate went to 11 cents, that seems like problem within a 12% or 12.7% increase. The reality is they were paying the old rates plus the power cost adjustment, which was appro approaching four cents. So, so I think that's probably one of the one of the things that uh, people need to keep in mind that uh, when you're comparing the new rates to the old rates, is you lost got a power cost adjustment that's you know basically gone down by almost four cents a kilowatt hour. So, okay. and again, I'll you know I'll be here to answer questions if people have thought they'd like. I do think that it's worth noting, though, um, with the electric. Um, I, I had one of the utility billing clerks on vacation, so I worked the window um, the first week of August when all the bills hit, um, along with the other clerk. So I was feeling all the phone calls. I was, um, I was at the window with all of the customers, and I very quickly found out. You know, everybody um, wanted to say, "Oh my gosh, my bill increased so much. These rates, you know, are just crazy." Um, the first thing I noticed after looking at the second or third customer's, uh, you know, history and their usage and their readings is the usage for electric was up quite a bit. I found a number of customers that were using 50% more electricity than what they were the month previous. So instead of, you know, trying to go into the explain the rate structure and how it changed mode, I immediately started looking at the usage because the, the increased usage with everybody in July, coupled with the rate increase, did hit people really hard. And it was just today that we got um, an email from AMP ahead of getting our own village power bill, the explanation behind the shocking increase that came for us right after this initial email, where it said that um, we were just, I think, 700 kilowatt hours under um, what July 2012 was, which was the you know highest usage on record for the entire village. So our bill for the village um, was 50% higher. It, I mean, it was double. It was absolutely double what it was the month prior for the village. So what was normally running us around 145,000 was 245,000 this month. So when we opened that email with our own village uh, power cost, it was shocking. But it, it was attributed to the increased usage across the board because and, of the hot month. And, and we've seen that same thing, uh, Melissa, with, with other clients as well. I mean, obviously, if you compare this summer to last summer, which is one of the mildest summers we've had uh, in some time, uh, you know, people, it's not uncommon to see people using twice or even three times as many kilowatt hours as they used uh, last June or, or July when they get these bills in August. They're probably going to see a similar situation. Right. So, yeah. so I think what we'll do is, I mean, I don't know if I, I thought this one, go ahead and say, but you know, this we should probably hear from citizens because it's really, but if you, if you want to give a question or comment oh, first. Awful. So what we'll do is um, we'll hear your comments and questions. We'll all be writing them down. We have the experts here to answer, so then we'll answer the questions. They'll answer the questions at the end um, after all we've gotten all the questions. Yes. And again, state your name. Sabrina Jewett. And while well, I appreciate all the information and all the numbers and all the, all I can look at is a $511 bill. And that's what I keep, those are the numbers I keep hearing and seeing in my head. It's a $511 bill, which I've lived here for 35 years and I can't begin to imagine. Um, and you know, I had a lovely discussion with a, a lady in the office. I think her name is Nathalie. Nathalie, yes. And she was wonderful and caring and kind, and trying to help me explain. And I've got all this information, which all I keep seeing is five hundred and eleven dollars. Now, you know, and maybe it's. And then I did get. I, I must have been one of your number three, you know, customers mm -hmm. where it went down to almost four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in some respect I should be grateful for that. Uh, however, I just keep thinking of all these folks that I talk to who say, now my rent's gonna go up because my landlord has to pay these high utility bills. I can't live here anymore. So who's gonna go to Tom's to the grocery? And who's gonna go to Dollar General? And who's gonna, you know, we may have a doctor out there, but who's, you know, if we keep rushing all these people out of town, who's gonna be here? 
to do to go to that doctor, to go to Dollar General, to go to I mean, there are people who absolutely cannot afford this. Um, I can afford it, but it was shocking. I just thought there must be, and I still am not convinced that there isn't more of a mistake in here um, than what I got this letter about. But it, it deeply concerns me, and it won't show itself for a while, but I think that we will start to see the effects of this kind of thing, um, you know, with folks who can't afford to any longer live here because of utilities and or they can't you know they can't afford their um, you know I don't want people to decide do I get my utility or do I go to the store and I think that's happening already I've, I've talked to several people with already so that concerns me as a village that that that's happening to folks and I don't know how to fix that but I just I needed to express that concern thanks Sabrina Hi, my name is Shonda Sneed. I've been a resident of this community for 40 something years. Um, I was shocked with my village bill, 300 and something. I called in and, uh, two weeks ago and spoke with somebody, and they said they were going to get back with me, and I haven't received your extended hours well still I work I'm not off until two or three hours after you close and um, it's getting very frustrated you know I explained to the person that prior to this we had um, visitors we had seven other family members that lived in the house and prior to that I could not argue the bill but now there's two people, myself and my mother. I don't get home, you know, regular time until after 5, 5.30, and still I gotta run around and still do things, and my mom's gone, and they said they were gonna send somebody to read my meter again, which they couldn't find. I had to explain where my meter was. Um, I explained, there's basically nobody home, and I got everything on timers, and. I have lights that, you know, the, you know, cost saver lights, I mean bulbs. I put new windows in my home and insulated and everything. I just cannot see for two people who are not there a $330 bill. And you know, and I'm lucky because I'm hearing thousand and five hundred. You know, I, I, I just can't see that when I'm very conscious with you know what it was of making sure that you know nothing is left on you know you got you know lights are not turned on everything is like I'm one of those people that I mean I dress lightly today but I'm cold all the time you know my my air conditioner is usually set on 76 75 is the lowest that I can we can go and I, I just cannot see that bill being that high. So th that's what, and my, my concerns is, please, you said that someone contact me. You know, maybe I'm one of those other people, but I haven't heard. You know, and I don't yell and I don't scream because it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't pay to do that, but I would be more than happy to talk to somebody like that. Just can't see it. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Mariah? Mariah Johnson, again. Yeah, just to kind of reiterate what Sabrina said, I think, um, I mean, personally, I have a new page payment that was due today. I don't have the money. I literally have no way to pay it um, until I get paid. And then that's a couple hundred dollars out of my rent so that I don't have any way to pay my rent in full. And I'm much more well off than half the people my age. Much more well off than probably a lot of senior citizens in town. Um, families, I live alone. I have a couple of cats. I mean, I've been not home most of the time. I work full time. So for families, for senior citizens, for people who are still trying to find their career path, I mean, 
completely understand the changes. I understand that you know we're trying to build a new water plant, that we're doing all these things, and that yes, the rates went up, but that's not really an answer because it doesn't give us any solution. People cannot afford to live here. We talked about affordable housing all year. Utilities about our economic growth. Businesses here, I mean, I've worked in countless businesses here who can barely afford their rent downtown. How do they afford to pay water bills and electricity bills if it is high? What happens to those companies that are owned by just maybe a couple or, or a family? Um, what does this do to our cultural diversity? I mean, we've been talking about a mass exodus of especially ethnic diversity out of Little Springs for years now as we become an aging white community. We know statistically that people of color, and especially families of color, are going to be affected by any type of affordable housing, affordable utility issue, far more than even white lower class individuals, um, working class people. So I guess my question is, what is the solution? I get the answer to why the utility have gone up, but what's the solution? Because we don't want an exodus out of this town. Um, there's a type of gentrification that's happening here, and I'm not saying that that's the utility's fault, council's fault, anything like that, but there's a serious issue here with what we're doing to our diversity, to our culture, to the people who want to come here and raise their families, to the people like myself and my grandparents that have lived here for generations that don't want to leave. They want to give to this community, and they can't. They have to move. People who want to be a part of our excellent education program here, who want to be involved in Antioch, who want to shop at Tom's Market, all of those things. Um, so I think it's even a bigger picture than just people that we see that come up here and say, well, I can't pay my bill. It's bigger than just me. It's what are we going to do to our village with these prices? And what's the solution? And for a personal pitch, Tomorrow night at the library at 6 30, I'm holding a community meeting for anyone who'd like to come and try to sort out solutions because I'm not giving any real answers here about what we're going to do about it. So, thanks, Mara. Anyone else? My name is Patrick McAfee. I'm pretty new to Yellow Springs. I've only been here a couple of years. Um, and I wish I would have started coming to these meetings a lot earlier. And I appreciate what you guys are doing. I just didn't understand the extent that all the decision making was going on here. And I'm really glad I came tonight because I learned some things. But uh, so I just have a quick, I guess this power cost, and this is where I kind of was thrown off by, right? It's this power cost adjustment. Now, who can, is this like AMP that's passing down this number to the village? Uh, well, basically, your power supply cost adjustments based on their actual cost of power, what they pay for their power supply. Uh, AMP is the agent that manages their power supply, but they're in a number of different uh, power supply projects that affect those costs. So, but it's basically the average uh, cost that they pay uh, for all the power supply arrangements. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just not exactly what you're but is like the village the one who determines that rate then? Well, it's calculated but on a formula that's set in the, in the ordinance. Oh, okay. It's not an arbitrary number, it's based right. on the actual calculation. And I figured there was a, uh, it was based on yeah, It's based on a three month rolling average. I, I think you, if you look through there, you'll see a sample that shows the calculation under the old and the uh, uh, the new uh, rates for the power cost adjustment. Okay. So okay. I'll show you what that I did see that, yeah, okay. All right. And then my next question is, is as far as our comparison to like surrounding towns and cities, like, uh, do you know what the typical rate is? Yeah, like we're, we're getting off of. Let's get back to the. To no, this. I don't know. No, yeah, go ahead. No, I, actually, we did, we, when we did rate setting, we did a comparison of the, those proposed rates to the rates of Dayton Power and Light, and they were, uh, in some cases, they're a little higher. In some yeah. cases, they're lower, just because their rate structures are a little different than what uh, Yellow Springs rates are, but. In general, they are competitive with the rates that uh, are offered by Dayton Power Line. Okay. Because okay. so that's after the increase, after the rate increase went into effect. Okay. Okay. Because okay. kind of what I was seeing through my own sampling plan, which is not, it's just very, you know, it's just basic and just kind of talking to friends and family that I have living around the area, and a lot of people are paying. So do those, are those, would you say, and I know this is maybe not 
completely on topic, but would you say that, or is this normal power cost adjustment? Is this something that's in every kind of utility bill? It, well, it's in most, this gift, it's a municipal system okay. where they buy the power. Most municipalities do have that. Uh, Dayton Power and Light actually has about 25 different riders that change almost monthly that build into their rates. I mean, we have one here based on power costs. Uh, but uh, power cost adjustments, or in the case of uh, Dayton Power and Light, it's a generation charge that changes periodically. Okay. Uh, but no, those are those are common adjustments that you see in uh, electric utility rates. And you would say that those are probably closer to, they try to keep them probably near zero, so everyone just understands their rate is basically. Well, they, they, they're not necessarily zero. Not zero, uh, but I would here, say not four cents. But here the reason they've gotten to four cents is because they've not changed those base rates for mm -hmm. um, 30 some years. So you've seen the accumulation of cost, power costs going up over that time. And so as part of the rate change was is to roll that back into the base rates and then you get that adder closer to a, a zero number. It could actually even go negative. Okay. So then just kind of informally, I'm talking to people outside of town and their rates are, you know, six, 7% kind of in that ballpark. And then here we are at this 11% rate. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because that's, I mean, when you start talking tens of percentages, because I run a business here in town, I run the pretzel truck. So I have a facility on the edge of town, I'm paying for power and all this stuff. And, you know, we start getting into tens and twenties and thirties with numbers. I mean, these are big numbers for small businesses. And I just don't know that we're, and this CBE thing sounds all fantastic. I don't know much about it, but I totally agree that we need to pass some of this cost on to somebody else, you know? And, you know, I'm not trying to be weird here. I don't know what everybody's thoughts on that are, but basically it's just that, you know, we start, it sounds like we're quite a bit higher than a lot of places. And then if we just, I don't know what the incentive is, number one with the locality here, we're prob we probably can command some kind of premium on our rent. And then number two, I mean, these utility costs are gonna be, it seems like quite a bit above where other places are. So for me, I'm like, I don't, it, is that really an incentive to draw businesses in the town, you know, unless they got high margins and stuff like that. But I'm a small time guy. This is the guy you want in town, you know? I'm buying products in town. I'm buying stuff at the hardware store, which is, you know, definitely not the cheapest place to go, but I'm just a local guy. I'm by myself. I don't have time to drive all over town, so. For me, and I talked with this young lady here, and uh, she was very nice at the window, and I wasn't—I didn't mean to come off if I did, and I don't think it. You know, I think it's very funny, but um, so just from my perspective here, you know, we're we're talking about just tens of percentages, and I'm just not seeing how that's going to be a big incentive to draw people into town. You know, plus I run—you know—I got a family. You know, just like I said, just moved here, got two kids. You know, single income household running a small business and I'm feeling a pinch. So I got employees, I got a payroll, I got the whole thing. And right now, like, then you run your own business, you know that it's not like there's just extra cash flowing around all the time. So I don't know, that's just kind of my concern. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I, Patrick, I mean, you, you, you say what we all feel too. I mean, it, this this has been a huge struggle for us um, raising the rates. We did think about it and talk about it. If you part of the reason that that Melissa put some of the historical um, documentation in there is is to show that we have this. Some members of this council, members of past councils, have not done what they needed to do as far as the rate structure is concerned to go 34 years without raising our electric rates is um, not good business. I mean, and, and, and we're basically in a, in a situation where we call our utilities enterprise funds because they're basically, they're businesses that are somewhat independent of, um, of running the government. We don't necessarily have to offer electric. We choose to do that, that was, that was a decision that was made obviously decades ago and but but we've chosen to continue with those um, and in fact when we had um, a few years ago when we started talking about water sourcing and building a new water plant it was um, citizens were pretty adamant that we maintain our own our own water source and our own water system and so it, it becomes for us 
how do we how do we make these systems sustainable? How do we provide water for you that's not brown? That's our that's our goal is to provide <laughs> good clean water for for the citizens and to provide adequate sewage and adequate electric and and you know another value that is somewhat impacting the uh, the electric rates are the fact that this community is environmentally sensitive and friendly and a decision was made to um, to adopt a, a strong uh, res uh, green portfolio so uh, with renewables so um, that is causing the cost of power to be a little bit more unfortunately um, but again it was a decision that was made that we, w we didn't want to be buying coal we didn't want to be buying natural gas we wanted to be buying clean fuels that were not hurting the planet so um, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't have an answer either. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's something as far as the rates, the, the rate decisions, that's with council. Um, staff, you know, certainly has input recommended. All of the utility, the direct billing things, some of the things that that um, Sabrina was talking about, I mean, those things go directly to the billing system. Um, rates. That's that's our job, and, and we have to balance the rates and sustain the system, and we, we know what an impact it's going to be having. Um, I, would, I would like to address one thing that Patrick said. Um, you, you said at, right there towards the end that you had done your own comparison, and, and you must have done that were like six or seven. It's and, informal, so I'm right, just I, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I just wanted to point out that one thing that John had mentioned is when you look at a bill from, for instance, before I moved here, I had Duke Energy. And when you look at your bill, and it can say six or seven cents, but then when you start looking at all the riders that go into it, it's actually much higher. So, yeah, if you start looking around and you see the, what DPML is charging, it may say six cents on the website, but then when you start looking at all the riders that go into it, it's not six cents. Well, so and, it's, and it's, I understand that you're yeah. going to have, but. For me, you know, I feel like that most utility, you know, I'm just so new to this whole thing, I don't know much about how every municipalities and cities, you know, and their riders and all this stuff out. But basically, what I'm understanding from him is that they try to keep that power cost adjustment at a minimal, you know, and I and I also see that it sounds like Yellow Springs just dropped the ball for 30 years and just didn't get their rates increased. And I'm not blaming anybody for that. I wasn't around for that and, you know, that's okay. but. So I know that it may not be six or seven cents. Right, it might be yeah. eight or nine cents, you know what I mean? Yeah, but, I, yeah I just wanted to make sure yeah, you understand yeah. that when you look at that bill for, for DP and L whatever, that's not really what you're Yeah, thinking. no, and I know that, but and that's what I was doing. I'm looking at the rate and I got this, you know, and now I'm looking at this cost adjustment. I'm like, geez, this is kind of a big fluctuating number that just can be, you know, from one end to the other, you know? And when you're talking about going from seven cents to 11 cents, I mean, that's pretty big at the end of the day, especially when you're growing, you know, thousands of kilowatt hours, keeping all your fridges cool and stuff like that, so. Um, well, a uh, couple of things. One, in terms of, you know, I was with the council, as Karen was um, back a few years ago. Um, our electric uh, system uh, balance was incredibly healthy, which is why we did not increase the rates, because we had more money in the electric system than we kind of knew what to do with. We didn't really need any more money. So just to say, mm -hmm. that was the reason we did not increase them, not because we dropped the ball. Well, um, but, but I'm not, I, no, I didn't I mean, no, 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 but I mean, it kind of sounds like that, but actually I was there and you remember right. we were, we had a very healthy uh, uh, balance there. So we didn't need to increase it, so we didn't. Uh, but um, but I mean, I guess you can't take money from one department and put it towards another department. Well, <laughs> like, well uh, we, I mean, we can't go put money from the general fund and put it into our, our, we can't do it, we can't put water into the electric and that kind of thing, but we can. So, but um, yeah, there's not an easy solution. I don't know what the solution I mean, uh, one thing that's good, I'm really glad you're having this meeting, Mariah, um, uh, because um, we're going to need all of it, you know, we're going to need the intelligent 
thinking of citizens to help us figure this out, and I don't know, you know, how much of a solution we need to come up with. Um, the Energy Board uh, is going to be asked to look at, you know, helping people think about how to conserve their usage. I mean, that's one thing that has to happen. You know, the um, some of the really high bills showed a very high usage of water. And there, it just, it, in some level, it doesn't make sense. So I think part of, you know, if citizens who've got those really high bills are being extremely careful with their usage, and, you know, we have to, you know, what's, we're gonna have to look at it from both sides, I think. You know, our billing folks are looking at the bills, trying to make sure they're collect, correct, that the meters are working properly. Uh, one thing that um, Melissa didn't mention that's in her paperwork, you know, if there's a real question about the meters, although Patty assures me they only get slower if they're older, uh, but um, if there's any question, are they really malfunctioning? Because, you know, you've gotten some extraordinarily huge amount of water that says you used, and there's just no way you are absolutely certain that there's no leaks, and your children are not using the water, you know, there's nobody home all day and all this stuff, and you get, you know, 35,000 gallons, then you think something's wrong here. So that is an option. However, uh, although uh, it's our policy that if there isn't a problem, you actually were using 35,000 gallons, then you would get charged to have it looked at, but it's what, $50? I thought I saw this a huge amount of money, but um, that's, that is an option. Um, in terms of electric, and as hot as it's been, and the air conditioning that people are, many people are using, not all, um, I mean, we can control how much water we use. You know, if we work hard at it with our households, uh, we can get it down to something reasonable. If we're getting these huge numbers and they're correct, then there's something about the usage that, and I think if there's groups like, you know, Mariah's, you know, starting to think about these questions, I mean, it's a huge wake up call on usage. If we're using that much electric, I mean, when it's hot out, it's hard to, you know, but how are we gonna, you know, it's a big wake up call in terms of potentially for, if people have been using it, they didn't realize it, which is, you know, then, you know, thinking about conservation together is another thing. And the Energy Board's gonna be thinking about giving people good, you know, advice about that and about the use of water too, I think. But yeah, I don't know, it's, I mean, some of these bills, well, you know, are shocking that people have gotten, and I, I don't know what to think about it. Um, well, and something else related to consumption with electric is that, not only did we raise the rate, but we went to a flat rate, and it had actually been a, a rate where the more you used, the lower the rate was. So if somebody is consuming a lot of electric, it, it's kind of a, a double hit, that, that the rate went up and it maybe almost doubled. I don't know, I don't know how much difference the rate. Actually, was. actually, the, uh, there's a rate comparison in, in the uh, packet that shows you even 2,000 kilowatt hours, it's still about a 14% increase. So okay. It's not, it's not a significant, most of the increase is actually in the front end of the room. Okay. The customer charge. It, and I would like to mention one thing that people can do right off the bat is a, a lot of times you'll see we put out peak shaving announcements. Diana's kind enough to put them um, online and, and uh, for us when we send them out. We put them on our Facebook page or, or our village website. But instead of waiting for AMP to send those things out at the last minute like they like to do to us, um, get in the habit of when you go to work, ch to change your thermostat. I mean, mine is programmable and it's already programmed during those peak hours of one to six to, to kick it up a little few degrees warmer in my house and, and conserve a little bit, um, a little bit more electricity. So um, I had a lady who emailed me and said, you know, I, I've already left for work and I didn't get your email so I couldn't I couldn't turn my thermostat today before I left and I, I'd like to help. And so try to get yourself in the habit. If you're not gonna be home during the day, it, it doesn't have to be as cool there. And then when you get home you can you can make it a little bit cooler. And don't do your laundry until after six o'clock or don't cook your dinner until after six o'clock. Because if we can shave peak hours now, we're going to save money when we start purchasing next year. Can you explain? Yeah, that? Yes, I think so. it'd be good to explain. Well, that, actually, your power cost, the, the village's power cost is about uh, 20 to 25 percent is based on the peak load in the summertime. Uh, to the extent you can reduce your load in the summertime, you can reduce the cost. So 
Uh, and so that happens during a certain time of day? So typically day. one between 1 and 6 o'clock on a hot summer day. So we've had alerts almost every day. Well, the, the last two weeks of July and the first two weeks of August, we've had alerts almost every weekday. So weekdays from 1 to 6, to the extent that you can reduce your load at your house or your business, it reduces the village's load, which reduces their power costs. So as I said, it's, it's not insignificant. Uh, that demand-related cost is probably about 20% of their power supply cost. And then, excuse me, then that will come back to us? Absolutely. That's what that power cost adder adjustment does, that power supply cost adjustment. Uh, they, if their power cost goes down, you see that as a reduction in your, your bill through the power cost adjustment. Automatic adjustment. That's only a fraction of the set, right? I, um, about I don't know. 20% of their power cost is, is about, four, so, about so a penny and a half to kill an hour. But then uh, to the customer, it's just 0 0.002. Well, this month no, About zero one five, right? not zero zero two. About zero two. I'm talking about if you can reduce their, their demand. Their demand cost is about 20% of their <laughs> power. Oh, right, right, right. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I a pretty significant you, amount. No, I, no, yeah, yeah, 20 is a lot. And I, I don't know what the energy board's gonna, board's gonna recommend, but I know personally, if I'm not home, I, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. I shut my air I, I, I don't even use air conditioning except under extreme, extreme circumstances. But I shut it off. And then I, then when I turn it back on, I turn a couple fans on, and it cools down pretty quickly. It's, it's fine. So maybe other people are already doing that. If you're already doing that, you know, then I'm not sure, you know, what to think what else. We're going to think about it together because uh, it's not an easy solution. Well, and with all due respect, all those things about conservation everything you don't you all don't know that we might always do you, that are many, that right you know I and know. to say I'm you know I'm 60 years old I I know to put my thermostat down I know not to leave the water running when I brush my teeth things like that I already know uh, you know it just those might sound I mean they're great I mean, if people aren't doing it that can help them but you know those are things that I'm already doing and have always done so to get this kind of bill when I am conserving, and I'm not going to tote gray water around and use it for things. <laughs> I'm just not. So, you know, that, that. I won't, we won't recommend that. <laughs> yeah. Except your point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I would also encourage people to utilize the utility dispute resolution board, too, if you think there's yes. If you're having a bill, it just seems out of sight. Um, Utilize them, and here's my own. Yeah. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, but it yeah. does have coffee. I just have a question. <laughs> the energy board that you're talking about, who is that? <laughs> what is that? Where do they meet? I mean, I, I just don't know everything. <coughs> it's a committee, commission of the council. Um, it meets once a month, and um, they haven't met the last two months in the summer because you know, members were away. Uh, but they're going to, I'm sure, start back up on the third. Summer. It's the third Tuesday <coughs> of the month at 530. It is at 5. Here is in this room. I'm thinking again of the populations that I wrote in about yes. uh, the critical populations who maybe have oxygen concentrators or who maybe just need to be in an air conditioned environment mm -hmm. and can't maybe can't afford to do it or maybe they want to take advantage of the peak shaving opportunity. Can they come to the village building and just chill? It's a public building, I mean, we only have. <laughs> room, but it, it's a public building, so. Can I, can I address that? Because I got a bunch of kids in a house and no air conditioning and a high bill and um, went through a lot of that stuff. And yes, my toilet was running. And I did not believe it would ever possibly cost that much. It, yes, it does. I found out much to my chagrin. But the cool thing, library is the best place in the entire world. And that's where you go when you go to the pool. I mean, we, that is what we do. We do not go home. <laughs> Most of us are we go to the library and we go to the pool until it cools down enough to go home, and that's that's how you do that. The other piece is too that if you've got those bills and you've got a market increase and you're you're on that line where things are extraordinarily difficult, it may tip you into a category where you can go to Job and Family Services and say, These are my bills and this is my income and I have kids or I'm above a certain age and you can receive uh, help with those bills. So I wouldn't just, I wouldn't write that up. I would absolutely keep those bills and keep your costs and consider that as an option. And it may be a no, but it, it's definitely, if you're on that line, you may get some assistance with that. Mm -hmm. Just really okay. quickly, I know everyone's turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, maybe I could uh, <laughs> talk, uh, do 
do the utility roundup blurb. <coughs> so um, there are some communities and some uh, power electric power companies that do what's called the utility roundup, where uh, people can opt in and have their bill round up, rounded up to the nearest dollar. And um, then there's some money gathered by that, and then that money can be used to help people who maybe they're having a really high medical bill that month and they just can't pay their utilities. So uh, I've done some research on it, and the idea was actually first suggested by Chrissy Cruz at H an HRC meeting. And so my request to council is to approve me uh, doing some more research, working with staff to come back to a proposal that Yellow Springs is for Yellow Springs to, for council to consider for Yellow Springs to institute such a program. Uh, I thought we gave you that at the last meeting, but I, I, no. I, I think it's great. I mean, I think, I think you should. Okay. And I would, I, the, all of the, I would like maybe at some point to work for you guys to work with the energy board though too because I mean my feeling is that I think it's I think it's a good program to consider but it it's it's a little bit of a band-aid if we're talking about people month after month sustainability um, it's it's you know so I would also like to look I appreciate it, it the fact that the energy board right oh it's it absolutely helps is a people help. who right. for one one time yeah. probably it would be like one time a year something happened and it's a source no I think that's fine but I think but I think that that really the bigger the bigger issue would be um, something that you know energy board might come back with regarding conservation I think that that's what we're gonna you know investing you know maybe having programs that we can offer people um, some of it some energy rebates some low flow shower heads, something that we can we can actually um, help them improve their bills Long term. Going, going forward, not just not just for a month. Well, I, guess, uh, I think long term, I think there's a lot of great ideas later. And I guess my short term question is, what are we able to do for people right now who can't pay these bills? Um, I don't know what village policies are about shutting all the utilities, but I know something you know Don spoke about. I know there's been a discussion on Facebook where someone said, you know. My elderly father's electricity was shut off, and we didn't know about it. Um, so, I, I mean, that's a concern. I know it seems like that's probably something that is a rarity, but I think it's really important. I think that there are policies or solutions about now that people have been hit with these bills. Yes, we've known about the rate increases, but then you get the bill and you just don't have the money in your account. How are we helping those people? I know you can't give it away for free, but I mean, are there? Are we just going to have people's utilities shut off? You know, after there's been this huge hike. We would know if there are some companies that. Well, yeah, Melissa. Well, I'm in the in the um, concerns document that I had uh, put together. I had outlined that there there are payment agreements. There are um, external agencies that offer support. We've got a list of those. They're on our website. Um, I think that actual payment agreement form is on our website. Um, so we try to um, provide resources that we're aware of to people that need them when they when they call and ask us. So um, we are able to provide that. Um, I mean, there's very limited things that we're able to do, but I mean, a payment agreement is, you know, that's huge. I mean, you can stretch it out for over six months if you need to. So um, payment agreement and then external agencies, I mean, those are the two options that we can offer people. Oh yeah, we and also um, I think only one or two months since the beginning of the year we've assessed penalties, which is um, in ordinance um, that if somebody is, does not pay on the 15th, then they are assessed a 5% penalty. We didn't assess penalties this month, so if you don't pay your bill until the 19th or the 20th um, because you need that extra time, then there won't be penalties this month. So um, that is something that we did this month. And is it my understanding that there was there was some change in the length of time or the process related to shutoffs? The bill, the sending the letters. Well, um, our our ordinance states that um, we have to send notices seven days. They have to be sent seven days before the date of disconnection. And um, we sent those last month, and people were saying that they didn't get them for two or three days later. 
And so I um, had noticed that when it came to disconnections, not every month, but some months, um, people were receiving them later. Um, with our utility bills and our disconnection notices, we send all of that information to a third party company and they're out of Columbus. And a lot of people don't realize it, but our mail gets shipped to Columbus anyways and then it comes back here. Um, not the most efficient thing in the world, but that's the way it works. So our third party utility billing um, printer and mailer is in Columbus. And when we send our utility bills, the village gets a bill for this building and all the other buildings that we have. And when we would send the bills, we would get the bills the next day. And when it was coming to the disconnection notices, because the village doesn't get a disconnection notice, there was no real way of us being able to tell what day those came in the mail. Um, so we are, we are actually doing a test uh, this, um, this, this cycle for the disconnection notices. We've got an option to send, if, if a, um, a tenant of a rental property is on disconnect, um, then the owner would get a notice. So we're going to flag a property in town that is an owner-occupied um, property with a um, owner duplicate that would be sent to the village. So we're going to we're going to do a trial on this. But anyways, I called um, um, Smart Bill, which is our company that we use, and we said, so is there any way, a uh, different way that you handle our disconnection notices versus our utility bills? Because we're getting complaints this month um, that they weren't you know, hitting the mail, you know, as they should, there was quite a bit of a lag. And they explained to us because there are so, so few um, disconnection notices as um, compared to the utility bills, that it all goes by tray. Um, our utility bills can fill a whole tray, they go straight to the post office, the post office doesn't even sort them, don't touch them, they go straight on the truck, here they are tomorrow. The disconnection notices, because there's, you know, it's only 10% of what we would normally send for our utility bills, they get put in a tray along with lots of other stuff. Those get treated at the post office much differently. They have to sort all those things and then they get, you know, that lag time and then they get put on the truck eventually and then they make it to town two days later. So we did we weren't aware of that, you know, treatment and sorting that was affording that lag. So what we are doing is we are now going to allow a two day buffer um, for mail versus the one day buffer that we were um, offering. And uh, the chief complaint last month with the disconnection notices was uh, the statement was made that it had to be paid by Friday. We checked the box. Uh, we never, we would never disconnect on a Friday for one. Uh, the payment was due on a Friday. When in reality, we check the boxes and uh, the lock boxes, which are, um, you know, if you pay your payment online or if you mail it in through US Bank. We check those every morning before we send anybody out to disconnect. So anybody that is paid up until 7.30, the morning of disconnection day would never be disconnected. So we change the language in the letter to reflect our actual practice, which you know, if previously we were saying that they were due the business day before, now we're saying they're due the same day by 7.30, which is when the staff comes in. And we're allowing more of a buffer um, for that mailing now that we're aware that there's that lag that we were not aware of before. So we we did change things after we were made aware that there was a bit of a an issue last month. So, and isn't there an expectation as as we as everybody moves from quarterly billing for water to monthly that that the next bill will the next that they may have, this may be the last large bill for some people yes um, anybody that had a uh, account that started with a three um, like I said if, if the meter reader couldn't get in in June for that final read you could have been estimated on your quarterly read because the system goes by the last um, the last read that you had and those were quarterly reads for some people so um, the the main the main thing is to let the meter readers read the meters and I know that some people we're getting notes on cards that are left. Um, we're getting some people that are pretty angry because the meter reader can't find their meter. We have a brand new meter reader and he can't know that your meter is behind uh, in a utility closet inside or it's outside behind a giant lilac bush. Um, so just please be patient with the meter reader. Um, we, we, our longtime meter reader has been out for some time and we've had a new guy um, that just started that's been here for about a month and a half or so. So just please be patient. But it is important that we read your meter because otherwise if we don't get an accurate reading, we can't detect leaks. 
we might be estimating you higher than what you should be so those are pretty important factors but yeah um, what with the quarterly cards? amount please. what about the cards yeah we do the meter reader will leave cards but um yeah, the chief them back. the chief complaint right now is that um people shouldn't have to read their meters so if you are receiving a card then that could be wise because they can't find your meter and if you can and you are able to read your meter that would be great otherwise if you could just call us and let us know where the meter's at we can send them back out with the exact location of the meter and we can do it on our own but yes we will leave cards if, if the meter reader is unable to locate your meter and a lot of people are getting confused by that because they've never received those cards before and they don't know what to do with them and that's because He's new, meter meter. he's new and he, he, Brian may have known where the yes. meter, meter was, but he doesn't. So when the people get a disconnect notice, does it tell them on that that they can make a payment plan? Is that something that, so people know that they've got? I, I haven't looked at, we just redid it to make sure, because the ordinance states very specific <clears throat> things that have to be in this letter and everything that is per ordinance um, is on that letter. Whether or not a payment agreement is mentioned, I'm not 100% sure of that, um, but I do know that I had a hard time fitting everything per ordinance in that letter, um, so I, I'm not sure if that's in there or not. I, I kind of feel like yeah, you can't pay your bill, and then you get a disconnect notice. It could maybe feel like there's nothing I can do So I want to get disconnected or something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, another question I have is, you know, I appreciated that Dawn, I mean, I'm sure you guys were thinking about this. I haven't really thought about the people who are needing electricity because of uh, life support. You know. Do we know okay. them? I, yes, we do I have said, a medical list. I, so I actually have a list of 11 people in my office that is in need of critical care. But I wonder, I mean, people go on oxygen, say, for example, all the time. All, all they have to do is notify the police I'm, department, yeah. and they update the list. Yeah. I get an updated list every time But I'm wondering if you necessarily thought to do that. Well, uh, I, you know, I, I have I patients in town, and like I didn't think to tell them you might want to let the... Maybe the newspaper. What about what? What about what the newspaper doing on HRC? It's just, uh, it seems like a piece of information that we keep needing to let people know because it's not something I have really thought about as a nurse, you know, taking care of people. You might want to let somebody know in case there's an emergency. I mean, I, I think I think Melissa actually noted it in one of her pieces of information. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying we should try to say it very publicly. So promote you know, it. Promote that. It's just people. So yeah, so if it's not on the website, Let's get it on the website. Yeah, Let's post it on Facebook. I know Diane will print it in the newspaper. We, we probably need to just say it every so often. Yeah. Is it possible <coughs> for a line on your bill to, to say that? A message? A message on your bill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, because I know on my DPNL, Bethany bill, there was a line that I could call yeah. and got my change through the medical reasons. So. Yeah, we can do that. And I think one other thing that Melissa had in her report is that um, she would like to, and I think she's mentioned this a couple meetings ago, that she would like to change utility billing companies. And she's talking about some of the problems she's been having. So um, she intends to bring a, uh, a resolution to the next meeting with, uh, with that proposal. So uh, I think if, you know that will help our staff, and I think it will just provide better information for our citizens too. I appreciated all the information Melissa put together. Uh, yeah, I guess I just want to say I I <coughs> understand and appreciate that this conversation. Um, well, I hope that it shows that we care about this a lot. It, it's terrible to be in this position. Um, but I think the other thing that it underlines is that it, I understand it's not satisfying uh, in terms of looking at that short-term bill and. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I think it's gonna to be tough to do something in the short term, but I think it is very important. I wanna underscore what Judas said about Mariah's initiative to bring people together. Um, and we need to, I guess, look at all the possibilities that can reduce this. I mean, you know, we talked about economic development earlier, that's a piece of it. We've talked about conservation. I love Karen's idea of how could we help people, uh, you know, invest in, uh, 
things that would lower their water use or their electric use. I mean, some real long-term solutions. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I just think I want to emphasize that this is something we're all thinking about all the time, and it's really difficult. And uh, we need to definitely address it. But, I, but again, I appreciate what Sabrina said. Um, what we're talking about, there are explanations for why these are happening, but it's not, you know, dealing with reality, right. and that's tough. I mean, yeah. I'm hoping right. that, uh, you know, the next post will be left. I'm hoping there's something here that, you know, maybe, I don't know, you know, that uh, there, that uh, somehow things will smooth out for people. So they're going to be up some, we know that, but um, hopefully some of these really outrageously high bills maybe between cons conservation and maybe people were somehow getting charged. I don't, I don't or just the reading, the, just, just the jumps are, between just the things stabilized, so yeah, yeah it's the, that sort of transition that may have bumped the bills up. And, we'll and ultimately we're going to be receptive to any sort of workable solutions to lower bills. So, I mean, that's the bottom line. So, I mean, we want to work on this. Uh, but, but, you know, I've had my adjustment and so forth for the, the couple months and so forth, and I'm realizing that my bill is going to be higher. You know, it's, we had to put things in place, but, you know, my bill is a shocker to me, just like it is to you, all my adjustments have been made. So, A small community, we asked for a lot, and we got paid for it. It's, it's, it's sad, but not true. You know. uh, and it's going to be tough. But we as council had to do what we needed to do in order to, to give and provide the, the services that people expect. And Unfortunately, I'm on a fixed income, but I understand it's going to cost me more money. So, you know, those that can't, we talk about things that we can do to help those that can't, but the rest of us have, have to understand that our, our utility costs are going up. And, you know, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's a fact of life. Whether it's this council or, or another council, we have to make the decisions, and, I, and I, unless I'm wrong, I can't see a council being able to come back and say we're going to make decreased rates. So this is it's kind of where we're going. And, and, and it's happening region wide, it's happening nationwide, um, unfortunately. Dawn, um, one, we'll take one more comment and then we'll move on. The, the current rate increase that, that we're on, we've got the 30% this year, 30% next year, and then a 10%. Does that cover the increased cost of the new water plant going up over the estimate, or will there be additional increases no, in just a few years? That was factored in. That was factored in. That was factored in. That, that's, that's so you why. knew back then that you would have a $7 million water plant? This, Wait, this is a whole, that's a whole new conversation that, um, no, we didn't, a bit, but we also didn't have good estimates. Um, we, we never had a construction, a, a decent construction estimate. I went back through minutes, I've got them highlighted, of uh, John Eastman saying, this is, is not, uh, th this is not an adequate estimate. This was just a, a discussion, a starting point in the discussion. So, um, that I, I, I wouldn't contend that the water plant doubled in price what we thought it was going to cost, but because we started out with not an adequate number. But the, we, Wolford, the Wolford estimates weren't predicated on those earlier numbers? They were predicated on the numbers that you just We didn't. Isn't that what this, isn't that what your rates are from? Right. Is from no, that no, that Wolford goes like Wolford. 2009. Right, okay. and, and again, understand with that Wolford um, study, we didn't accept, we actually, they, they recommended we go with a 30% increase back then. So that was back in 2009, they recommended we go with 30%. Their next choice was a 20% increase. We chose to go with a 10% increase. 
And again, when you front load those rate increases, it brings in more money more quickly. So it's always better to front and load. We didn't want to do that because we didn't want to. So, so again, until this time, I mean, until until 2015, 2016, we have we have gone as, as lightly as we could on increases, and we kept showing red our our between infrastructure projects. We did two major infrastructure projects last year. We did the loop completion and the bottleneck project that, that from, a, from a distribution standpoint, dramatically improved the, our fire suppression capabilities. And, and um, so it's, um, there has been a lot invested and we just were not, um, our rates were not barely covering sustaining the system as it was, let alone having money for capital improvements. I'm getting, a, I mean, is your question about is the current rate plan going to cover the water plant? Yes. And so, John, it, it is, right? Oh, no, no. I mean, I, no, I, I didn't answer that. No, All right. I, didn't answer that. I thought you were talking about Yeah, but that. what yes. we did um, was our cap did the study, and they told us, you know, with, with the rate increase that they were recommending, which was what council implemented, was it was gonna bring in this amount of money for all of these years. So what I did was I took their spreadsheet, which was massive, and when they were in negotiations with the cost of the water plant, what I did was I took those figures for different scenarios for cost of the water plant, and I started out with a low number and I went all the way up to like 10 million. And I looked at the effects that it was gonna have on the water fund with the rate increases that were just implemented, or were implemented. And I told them what I was comfortable with within the parameters of the rate increases that were passed. So the number that they are working with was the number that I looked at with the rate increases to be comfortable with so that we wouldn't have to raise rates. Beyond, so beyond, 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 beyond what was already a clear, at, yes, right, that we correct, would not go higher, right. So are we ready to move on? And just so you know, Karen has been incredibly good. patient. <laughs> the clock has stopped. Just so you know, it's because you taught me well. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. I know. It's 10 o'clock. I know. It's 10 o'clock. It's past 10, 10, 10. When I looked at it, I thought, that can't be right. Uh, I'm yawning. Um, okay, so we're, I mean, clearly, I hope you're hearing. We hear you. We understand. We are concerned, and this will be an ongoing conversation. We have different approaches. Um, and Mariah, thank you for taking that on. I really hope to be able to create a nice um, community initiative here with lots of community feedback because I know there's a certain group of people that like to come to village council meetings and that leaves a lot of people out. So that's one of my main goals in this and I'm hoping to work hand in hand, you know, with you folks to be able to relay um, a bigger message, I guess. And so hopefully find solutions. Sounds great, thank you. Mariah, if you, if you would, email me and let me know how that, that goes, and, and I will give you my card, but I don't have it. You can email me off the Village website. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, next item under new business is a request from AACW, um, which is happening on September 10th. And I don't have my paper here. Here it is. So, um, so it's 19th annual AACW Blues Jazz and Gospel Fest, September 10th. What are the uh, what are the hours planned, Karen? Much fun. Not mine. I was different. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I got over or something. <laughs> uh, we're going to start it at four o'clock. We'll have the vendors out there. We're going to come around two. At 4 o'clock, what we decided to do this year uh, is to have a um, memorial, a mom, celebrate her. That's what this is all about this year, celebrating my mom's life. Because she gave 19 years since when she started this thing. And uh, when we moved to ACF since 1992, because it started in 91, John 6. So it starts at 4 o'clock with the memorial service, and there will be a proper Episcopalian, that's what she was, and that's what she wants, and she wanted a big party. So we decided this was the best time and place to do this. And then five, five period of cool with music. Pardon, on the 10th, on Saturday, because of 
Thursday we'll have Gospel Fest at the First Presbyterian Church. And then Friday we're going to do our blues, B-L-O-O-Z, blues <coughs> poems. Um, that will be down at Hertz. Down at the, um, the important. The important, thank you. Yeah. And then, um, and that's backdrop blues with ports and it's, it's all right. But anyhow, uh, then, then our festival day is that, that Saturday. And during the day, we're going to have workshops uh, throughout. My like guy Davis is coming, and we're going to do one at the um, at the brewery, which is going to be a lot of fun because it's going to be didgeridoo and harmonicas and all kinds of things. And I always put in everything we do. You don't if you can't, don't have an instrument. We're going to have a kazoo and we just so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's for everybody, eight to eighty, and. And we tried, we tried another one, which I don't talk about the other ones, because they're kind of like a little private surprise for everybody. But we'll have them in different places throughout the day. And then 4 o'clock we start. So. And, and what, uh, what Karen is asking is that uh, we waive um, the fee. The fee would be the rental. the rental fee for the Bryan Center would be $235. Um, I, Plus an additional thirty dollars deposit. Is that unless you waive the deposit? Yeah, we, well. well, if we waive it, we waive it all. I well, it's just a deposit, right? So you Correct. It would be returned. Yeah. Um, so um, and and Karen did fill out the she completed the form. I guess that he asked and well, provided can, lots of information. Yeah, I was going to say maybe if you want to highlight a little bit just about the mission and. Yeah, you know, my boy said everybody counts, and she meant that really from yeah. bottom of her What she was. This is getting a little heavy for me now. Okay, I mean, this is getting a little emotional, so yeah. Don't ask me too many. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think, I mean, it's everybody's looking forward to it to be back. Um, I think hopefully everybody in this room has been to Blues Fest and, and knows what it is. So um, we generally do it over at Antioch. But this year we're happy. I have to say because I'm in Antioch as well, and so therefore the reunion is that weekend. Oh. We have always done it every year, the first weekend after Labor Day. Then we tried to move it around a little bit with different options, different things were having happening that particular weekend. And then another kind they tried it because in the, uh, August and it was so hot, it's they hot. said no, that's not going to work. So then we tried it at the end, so back and forth, and we have found when we have moved it around. We lose our, 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 our artists, you know, because you got to book them. A lot of people, because I was getting these punches too, a lot of people buy tickets and they fly in for the festival. And a lot of them are buying these tickets six months in advance because they always know it's the first weekend after Labor Day. And they were saying, oh no, it's going to be the 26th of such and such, and oh, such and such is not coming because we, so it became just a real, you know, fiasco. So we decided this year, this is what it is. We have folks coming in from all over the planet should bring this to so well i'll help you highlight a few things that Thank i think you. are awesome <laughs> one of those being you know our our village value of being the welcoming community and thinking about diversity i mean obviously that's what this event is about uh i love the education component and that's one of council's goals uh is to provide youth programming and uh I that's love, good because i'm a music educator yes yeah <laughs> all over the planet that's exactly right and I love uh, the idea of the village hosting the event myself. So, and I wanted to have a poem because that was becoming a, a, a situation for us. Is that where are we going to do this now? The Anak has that locked down on us. Then we went to this place and that place here in in the village, and because we have got to have you know, I mean, can you have a blues festival without a beer garden? I just you know. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, um, so none of those places were coming up. So what we're going to do? We're going to go out of town. Well, can we go to Springfield? Well, my mom left this as our legacy here in Yellow Springs. They want to keep that ball bouncing. So that's why, you know, I, I let's do it here. So that's what we need. We need some help. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Shonda? Uh, yes, I've been a member of ABCW almost since its beginning, and I do want to say. AACW is Yellow Springs. And it's something that Yellow Springs does not want to lose. So that's why we must stand up as a community and embrace this and, and keep it in Yellow Springs because it was created by Yellow Springers for, um, for the Yellow Spring community. And it would be a shame if we do not keep it here. Thanks, Chanda. Yeah. So 
Does anybody want to make a session? Well, the, on Saturday, it's going to be at the Bryant Center. Is that <laughs> <laughs> I, I, on the front lawn here. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that's what I asked because it's rain. It's rain. In the event that it does, we have to look at weather out there. Um, you can come inside down to the gym. I'm going to ask them to go this for something else or not. I mean, that I, it, yeah, well, I uh, what I do know is that it was rented. I mean, this 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 day for the Bryan Center has turned over to a few different times. It was <clears throat> it was rented for something that was canceled. Actually, two things that were both canceled. Mm -hmm. um, it, Cyclops was supposed to be here. It's moving over to Mills Lawn. There was supposed to be a yoga thing here that was canceled. So I have a feeling that it's not booked, but. I mean, that's going to be something that's, that right. Sam's going to have to say. Yeah, you, you would have to check <coughs> with Samantha Stewart or Nell um, downstairs in, in the youth center. Usually, oh, right, right now, Sam's out of the pool most of the time, but Nell is usually down there in the afternoon, and she should be able to help you out with that for sure. Okay. One thing I was going to ask you, because I'm going to you too, you all, because uh, I think I was told 10 o'clock is the cutoff time. Yes. Is it possible to move it a little bit more? Just you know, because I wanted to end this thing with Guy Davis, and I wanted to be contemplative. I think that means that shorts are our people coming in too. So I'm wondering, is it possible to move it How like one more hour? It? If it is possible, to get to 11 o'clock, this would be before to tell. I mean, I would or finish. They said I would be for us. They were doing all we can. To we, well, they. That was not done for Springs Fest. Springs Fest was supposed to go to 11 o'clock, and and they were forced to totally reschedule, totally reschedule everyone um, in the lineup and actually take people out of the lineup um, because the village said only it has Why? to stop Good. at 10 o'clock because of the noise ordinance. The, the, and they get the the noise well, that's what I'm saying. The guy is is quiet. He's one. He's a solo foot performer. And the other piece of that too is that we're starting. The reason I'm asking because we are going to put the uh, honor my mom at four o'clock. That 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 period. I didn't have that hole there. Mm -hmm. I, it, it would have started early and and done a completely different thing. But because we're going to um, start it at four with, with the memorial service, that's why I'm asking that so that we you know have a really. You guys might want to keep your issues clear here. So, I mean, it might not set a great precedent if council makes a decision to alter the time frame. And then, right. yeah, thrown back to Patty, that's fine. But uh, the request is for the waiver. I just want to caution you about setting that precedent. I, I mean, that's been the precedent of uh, the, uh, the Blues Fest has always gone later, and you could hear it all over town. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was always going to the town. Pulling it back, pulling it back up again. Yeah. And they were always complaints. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I, I support doing whatever we have to do to make it later. This is, like people are saying, this is an institution. It, it, this is it's not the same. The, 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 and I'm I absolutely fine with it. So. I just don't understand what the... Well, the, the, the North Ordinance says 10 o'clock, and it, normally if it goes past 10 o'clock, we get quite a few complaints from the, the residents nearby, especially the ones that live up on Cemetery Street or, you know, somewhere so this is going to be a quieter. I mean, I'm, I would support that. That's I my personal, I mean, maybe council should just indicate to staff. I mean, this is the kind of decision that I think starts to get dangerous for council to make um, because it, it's. Well, we don't want. This is my mother. This is my mother. I can hear her right now. Right. If there is right a now. problem, let's not do that. We will. We will. We will do what we have to do. We'll make sure sets whatever we have to do. I'll get along with everybody. Do what we're going to do. But I want this to be wonderful. Can we celebrate my mother? Can we revisit a later time next year? Can we revisit it? I mean, I, you know, that give some time to talk about this. Um, I see, but I'm just saying, as far as this, but but have have but no, I know that's what I'm saying. I'm saying maybe if we thought about it for next year mm -hmm. after you know talking to folks, I, I don't know. I, I, I personally feel 11 o'clock. I is should be the 
it is a is a fine time for I I don't know I don't know we can look at the ordinance I don't know I um, it, but it is going to have to be across the board I mean you know we can't we can't say one event can go to, to till eleven and another event can't so we're going to be making an across the board decision right I mean that's that's I think the pause here is just you know again we've said no before I'm being fair. It's just that it's, it's been such a long Well, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you can make exceptions. I don't think sure. everything has to be exactly Well, believe me, I've been a big supporter of this <laughs> happening. So, yeah, that's uh, I have I'm a just... question for Karen. But it's only, you're only wanting it to go late because of the memorial for your mother, right? Yeah, so it's not like an it. annual thing that you would want it to go later. It's just this time around, it seems early. Usually, we, we, uh, when we're out here at Antioch, that's a whole different right. space and place. Right, so therefore we have, I know last year we finished it was a 10. Right. It just seems like to well, we got rain now too, that was the other piece. But, um, but then also if there's a problem and if people are complaining, I'm sure that you're willing to work, you know. But like she said, towards the end it's going to be quieter, it's going to be more mellow. It just seems like if it's just, if we're just talking about this single time here at least, you know, Later, but we're just talking about this specific time for faith. I think, you know, put, I'm sorry, Diane, for you getting here again. Put a little note in, I mean, you could write up something really nice, just a little excerpt that says, you know, sound ordinances lifted in honor faith for yeah. for an hour. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be some people who are a little peeved that, you know, you know, you can't make your Or maybe there. not if it's as, uh, as it, if it's as quiet as, as you expect it to be. Oops. If you don't hear anything, what's the complaint? So some I like the fireworks. I, I moved that for this AACW Saturday night, September 10th, that we make an exception to allow it to go until 11 o'clock. I was actually talking about a motion on the thing we're actually supposed to be doing. Oh, oh. On. oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I moved that motion. That we waive. The uh, deposit and the two hundred and thirty five dollar charge for the Bryan Center for this for AACW on September tenth. Yes. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. See how I can almost best of that. Okay. All right. We're having a good time. And I mean, <laughs> how did we read this? How can we? But you know, that's just fair to me because the most lot of the fireworks and that goes to eleven. Throw up a Personally. Are we finished with me? Um, yes, thank you. You look for now. What well, energy you want me? <laughs> the way we decide. The fireworks is an exceptional one. Uh, yeah, I guess it is. It's very loud here. All right, well, just roll. Do you want to finish your motion? The motion that I just made, I'm putting that on the table that this one time for AACW would be allowed the event to go to the land. Yeah. In order so to not on the page yeah. Second, second. All those in favor seem to have a saying aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe, I mean, there, there is, I think that there is language in the noise ordinance that relates to to occasional, occasional things, occasional events. So I think we can thank you. If, if we are having music at the Bryan Center every weekend, I think that we can, I don't think, I think we can, for events, I think we can say maybe 11 something. I think we can. Thank you. Okay, um, manager and assistant manager's reports. Um, mine is not uh, too long. Um, one thing is Jason and I did a walk around with Chris Bongiorno and Eric Hover from the Active Transportation Committee. And um, one idea that we came up with was a bike corral, which if you look at my additional um, my additional report in the, in the packet, um, Besides the share roads, which is an arrow telling you to share the road with a bicycle, 
Um, we talked about a wide corral at, in the parking space in front of the handicap space on Short Street by the U.S. Bank. And um, it, it would be a temporary pilot project to see how well it would be used where we could put um, a, a couple of bicycle racks in there that could be removed um, for events and for um, plowing to see if folks use them. But it's a consistent problem that we don't have enough bicycles working downtown. And this, we thought this was a, would be a good way to, to try out this pilot project. So if council um, is okay with that, we will move forward with putting in a, a pilot project um, of a bike corral at that location. Okay, sounds good. I love it. Um, some time back, we received a concern, council received a concern from a citizen on North Walnut regarding parking. Um, we have checked that out, and it does seem like um, normally it's okay to park on both sides of Walnut. Work on that, but during events, it does get quite congested there. Uh, so the question is, does council, excuse me, does council want to um, to make that parking on one side of the street only, or because it is not a persistent problem and only seems to be during special events, um, to move the way it is and allow parking on both sides? Sure, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, North Walnut, Walnut Street, north of Dayton Street, um, up past the laundromat and on up towards the brewery. Parking on both sides of the street. Right. Currently right there's parking. It's only on the one side. No, currently there's parking on both sides of the street, but during events when it's quite congested, it's, it's some residents have complained that it's difficult to pull in and out. Um, but pull in and out of their driveways or correct. pull in and out of their driveways. Is it building? Uh, visibility and, and just <clears throat> confined space, although I do have a video um, that Officer Meister shot and um, it doesn't seem to be so much about confined space in my mind as it is visibility. Well, say if it's confined space, the car gets towed. Right. If, if they block somebody's driveway, they should be towed. Right. Um, but it does seem to only be a problem during special events and, and then it is a problem. And then I think that I think we've at least for street fair we've talked about ways to control correct and not allow parking at all on Walnut during street fair. Um, I don't know. And if, besides, I mean, does, can someone also get a ticket? I mean, if, if they're if they're illegally parked, but I think part part of the issue with the citizen was that it's just difficult for them to see backing out because park the cars are lined on both sides. Mm -hmm. So. But do the, do the is it do we do we have one citizen complaining or I, I, is, is it the whole area saying that I believe we have two. one side of it? I believe we have two two residents complaining. See, because my concern is, you know, if the rest of the folks aren't aware of that issue, and now all of a sudden they see there's no parking on right. the right side. And that is a concern because yeah. right now people do park on both sides right. of the road. A resident part right. of the What did Officer Meister show? Um, he he had a, a a video of during a special event, um, and the cars were pretty much lining both sides of the road. Um, but a car was backing out of the driveway, and he didn't seem to have any trouble backing out. But as far as the width of the road, um, so he was able to get in and out of his driveway. So it's more of a visibility issue, I, mean, I think, for those two residents that, that were concerned. Yeah, I, it doesn't seem, it seems like it's, okay. And then the last thing I have is the, the regular station. I know, pull it back in. Um, the last thing I have is the note that's going to be in there until December, and that is that the planning and zoning office will be closed for most of the month of December. Because uh, Denise has a lot of family things that um, she has going on, and she decided to take her time off. Then. Okay. Melissa, anything additional? Um, nothing additional. Everything's been covered, so I'll pass the torch. Just uh, if you folks want to give the nod to Chris Piper, you can go ahead and do that. If you do not, uh, I can put it in the paper, and we can uh, attempt to find someone to uh, apply for that position. Got, got the recommendation in the, that's for the PCA. Mm -hmm. Correct. Judy, will you go with 
whose duty is it to make that recommendation to counsel? Well, it's kind of mine because there is not a person who does that. So when it comes to EBA, I do it. Um, and planning commission, I, I often will do it just because it kind of makes it a more neutral thing because it's council decision. Um, that body doesn't make a recommendation either way. With those two commissions, they are required by ORC. Um, the longevity is significant in those cases, and the body's knowledge is significant in those cases. It's not. Do we have, uh, remember how we, with planning commission, we have a alternate? Do we have that for BCA? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, it, okay. it, it's not a council person. I'm Correct. There is a council person. Okay, so, and so, then I was, what, so they basically come to you and you present it to us. So, so Chris is so, interested yeah. in. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he wants to. And, uh, and so right, but but uh, right. Anne is also the alternate and might be interested. That the alternate moves up only if there is only not that position is not filled. Yeah. But I, I guess I'm questioning, does the alternate usually come to the meetings so that they're... The, the alternate's been pretty active historically. Well, I've been there. So there's, there's someone <laughs> I, always... The recent history of that, yeah, yeah. that board yeah. seems to have somebody the same. Somebody the same, somebody we're using. Oh, I see. So you're pretty busy. Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty busy. active alternate. Okay. But we're, but we're talking about his term. He, he has said he wanted to continue. Correct. And then when they say that, we just go ahead. No. Correct. My point about the BCA in, in planning commission is that yeah. specific to those two commissions, there's a body of knowledge required yeah. for those commissions that is different from any other board of commission. That's why I wrote it the way that I wrote it. You all can decide you do not want to do that, but that is why I'm recommending in that direction, and I wouldn't and that wouldn't be the case if it was HRC or right. how, how many years has he been on? He's been on one term, which is how many years? I mean, I I think generally it's a good idea to open up the bid, and uh, if they're the most qualified person, that's the person who can choose that. Or if there's, I mean, I guess I don't know. So uh, I I would support uh, having him be on for another term. Uh, it's not since he's only been on one term. Yeah, and and hopefully Dan will continue. I think that something that's happened with the with the alternate positions is that they've actually they're as active on the commissions as the um, as if they were a member. So I think that that's really brought a lot to those to all of those commissions, and also a lot of continuity. If somebody does happen to miss a meeting, and then they can sit in and know what's going on. I, I do think Judith's point is valid, though, um, in terms of just giving people opportunity, you know, with the idea that the best qualified would be. The yeah, choice. it's nothing so, about Chris. I, I don't, you know, it's nothing about any particular person. It's just, uh, I, I think that sometimes it kind of freezes the, the uh, process a bit, where that person who's already been there, you know, is kind of the go-to. So just as a, a process, I think it's better to open it up first. I can be voted. You're, you're calling me. Um, I'm, well, I really, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say. I'd like to make a motion that we just extend uh, Chris Frankfurt's term for the five years on the B's I'll second that. What do I do when I'm going to abstain? Can I still call the vote? You call the vote. Okay. All those in favor, signify so they say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. I'm staying. So, did you get that? I got it. Okay. So, um, can we just kind of say? Oh, so your your reports up. Can we just kind of say if there's any highlights in the? Uh, board and commission reports for somebody to say or is anybody do you, we want to go through all the board and commission I need reports? to say something about uh, the well, wait a second okay but wait um, Jerry do you have anything about planning commission no, we didn't meet okay go ahead then uh, yeah so um, I uh, was at the last human relations commission meeting 
And the main thing I wanted to highlight was we had a large group of citizens who uh, drew up a letter with recommendations uh, about um, our local justice system. And uh, it was, it was, it's a great group of folks. And one of the things they emphasized at the HRC meeting is that they are willing to be more actively involved in um, bringing forward ideas. Uh, I, I think it would be great to have that letter in the packet. I thought it was going to be um, in this packet. And so uh, to maybe we can make sure that that's in the. Well, then was that a letter from HFC itself or from the citizen group? The citizens group. Um, yeah, so I, th I think it would be good for all council to see that. The citizens group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so this was, uh, yeah, uh, John Gudgel is, is uh, I think, one of the leaders of the group. Um, a few others that really uh, were actively involved. And a lot of, yes. yes. So it was, an, it, 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 it was an extension of the 365 project. Um, but they, you know, made it very clear that they want to help and uh, and they had some good suggestions. So we definitely want that letter in the in the next packet. Well, definitely have to send it to me then. Right? No, I know. I, I'm surprised it wasn't <laughs> sent. It's not. It's not on you. I don't know why it wasn't sent. I thought it would be. Um, but yeah, I just I, I thought that was great. And so. Um, I think um, Kate sent it to me just before the meeting. So mm -hmm. I can get it. Okay. Um, do you have any, any other commission you want to report on, Brian? Um, I think we got the, the main work product from the ESC in our, you know, on the table. So, Judith. arts and culture didn't meet. Okay, Judith. Uh, the library commission, well, Patty was there. They just, uh, they were talking about the roof and north side drainage, ceiling tiles, condenser alarms, masonry repair, south window wall, waiting for funds for that. Uh, loose railings and the food forest garden is looking great. Um, so those were they're just a lot of little repair issues, which Patty basically said is crew is busy in the summer with all the mowing grass and so on. I, I think the committee was getting a little like, when is this going to get done? But she was explaining that once the weather gets a little cooler, that uh, staff will be available to make those repairs. Okay. And the energy board did not. Marianne. Um, well, I'll just pull out a couple things from the Wellhead Commission. I mean, from the Environmental Commission. Well, one is working on the Wellhead. <laughs> um, EC is going to be losing one of its members. So I would, Jessica D'Ambrosio. So I think it would, and there is someone who's expressed interest, but I would like to have uh, that notice in the paper that interests him members, um, people who might be interested in the Environmental Commission. And um, uh, Deward will be coming to one of the upcoming uh, council meetings to talk about the climate action plan. I think that's in September, we said. Um, and the Beaver Management Task Force met. And um, they're working on looking at how to um, get the water flowing in the uh, stream that leads into the glass line. Thank you. Um, Can I just add, since Marianne made that request, if we could add to that um, advertisement, the Arts and Culture Commission, and also uh, probably be good to uh, see if community access panel folks interested would be out there to bring them off hiatus. Okay. Okay. Um, I have MERPC and Green County Regional Planning in the packet. Um, the Chamber. Um, we do have a meeting this Thursday, 9 o'clock in the morning, at the Senior Center to discuss holiday planning. So if um, any, it's, a, it's open to anybody, but it's specifically going to be talking about what we're going to do to bring business to town and to encourage uh, local shopping and activities during the holidays. So please come to that. Um, okay. Uh, future agenda items. Looks like we're going to have a busy meeting on September 6th. So we've got uh, Shook coming to talk about um, the water plant and you know, a number of ordinances. Um, looks like planning commission things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Number of planning commissions. So 
Jerry was probably aware of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, starting September 19th, we'll be hitting the budget. So we've got, uh, we've got a busy fall. We need to add one item. Uh, it won't take long, but just to let everybody know that we're paying attention to it, which is the medical marijuana legend. Oh, would you say five words about that? Uh, it won't be five, but it won't be more yeah, than Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody um, knows. Just so people know that we are monitoring the situation. Um, the law technically takes effect in September. Um, the highlights are that uh, there's no rules around it. Uh, Within one year of the effective date of the law, the Ohio Department of Commerce and Ohio Board of Pharmacy have to separately adopt rules regarding standards and procedures for what each entity is responsible for administering. Um, and I think they're probably going to be defining that. Uh, the other part that's relevant is uh, that uh, those two departments have then one year to set up the rules and then two years to create an effective system. Uh, but it's 240 days the Department of Commerce has to adopt rules regarding licensure of cultivators. So there's three pieces. Cultivators, i.e. people who grow the marijuana, the people who process it, and the people who distribute it. I suspect distribution will take place through pharmacies. Um, other highlights, uh, you can't uh, have cultivation uh, or distribution within 50 feet of parks, schools, playgrounds, libraries, etc. that one would typically expect to see. Uh, another side light, which is kind of interesting, is it's not smokable medical marijuana. It's not combustible. It is only in edible form, tinctures, or patches. That's all I have to say. So, right, and, and so basically the justice, he'll go over all this, but there is some some question, or Chris is suggesting maybe we want to look at some legislation. Yeah. I, I don't think so. I you mean, don't think so? What okay. you're seeing are communities that are, that are considering moratoriums, um, but the village has the right to explore this is, this is an economic opportunity or something that the community may want and has the right to uh, say no through zoning so um, if there's a lot of things to be worked out okay. and I, I'm getting the impression some there are council members from a lot of these communities that are questioning why they're doing it why their communities are they're they're opposed to well, the referendums typically have been an indication that perhaps that community is not open to it, although there's a logical reason to do it, which is nobody knows what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So by having the referendum, you've got some authority that says we're not doing anything. But okay. it's a distinction without a difference. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, secretary, say aye. Aye. aye.